Yes, we are told today is Thursday, June 15th. It was 3 a.m. Welcome to the baking of the Dallas Light Commission. Commissioners, we're going to go ahead and get the target, folks. As always, let's keep all our, our comments and concerns uh, to the, for the horseshoe. Yeah, keep the comment section of the horseshoe. If you have questions today, we do have a full docket, so it's going to be a, uh, a brisk briefing. We're going to keep a good pace. Uh, we got a briefing from Mr. and we'll start with that. Good morning. Good morning. So, good morning to you. Oh, okay. please. Okay. District 1, present. District 2, present. District 3, present. District 4, District 5, present. District 6, District 8, District 9, District 10, District 11, District 12, present. District 13, District 14, and Place 15. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, David Delguera, serving as the uh, Director of House and Neighborhood Privatization. Um, Andrea Udrea invited me this morning to come down and share with you our House Housing Policy 2033. Uh, I brought along with me our assistant director, uh, Thor Erickson, and our uh, senior policy analyst, uh, Vicki Coppenheim. So um, they, they've all helped us work to develop this. This is a policy that was initially presented to the full city council in March, and it was later adopted in April of this year. Next slide. So we'll start out by um, sharing some background the factors that led up to the adoption of the comprehensive housing policy back in 2018. Then we'll review some of the various activities that have happened since then. We'll drill down into Dallas Housing Policy 2033, what are the different components that make it up. And then finally, we'll walk through some of the ongoing implementation um, activities. Next slide. So, back in 2017, um, the housing department was responding to a series of compliance allegations. They were coming from every direction. They were coming from the city auditor's office. They were coming from the U.S. Department of Housing and Development. They were coming from the HUD Inspector General's office and the media. Right? One of the first things I got when I got here is, where's the $30 million? Where's the $30 million? And I'm like, what do you think I stole? <laughs> What's going on here? So that was the climate that we were dealing with back then. Um, at the same time, the city had commissioned University of Texas off on Arlington to issue a poverty study looking at recap areas, racially, ethnically concentrated areas of poverty that were growing across the city. What they showed is that from 1990 to 2016, they had doubled. And they weren't just in the southern sector of the city, they were popping up in the northern sector and really everywhere. And then you had this steady rumblings that was going on by housing advocates asking for more affordable housing, asking that the city invest more into affordable housing. Next slide. So we adopted the company's housing policy 2018. And we accomplished quite a bit under that policy. What this uh, slide shows you is a breakdown of some of the key areas of production that we've had. If you look from the top, our land bank land transfer programs, this is where we sell lots to home builders and they develop single family home housing. This is largely our home um, homeownership tool. If we're trying to promote home ownership, this is one of the primary tools that we use. Many of you are familiar with the mixed income housing development bonus program. 
That's a tool that doesn't cost any money to the city. We're essentially borrowing density bonuses, be it parking reductions or um, elevation or, or higher interior density in exchange for affordability. Then we get to our home repair activities. Home repair activities are our preservation tool. We use it largely to help senior citizens age in place. Folks who can't afford to call a handyman, they're calling us because they've got a hole in their roof or because their house is leaning one way or another. And um, we work with them to provide um, home repair services that range from minor, major to reconstruction um, um, on, on a cement basis, more forgivable loan basis. We've got two corporations, the Public Facility Corporation and the Housing Finance Corporation. Both corporations have no money. What they have is the authority to issue tax-exempt bonds. As you know, property taxes are expensive in Texas. It's roughly 2.65%. So if you're building an asset that's anywhere from 50 to 100 million, you can do the math and see what your operational costs are going to be over the life of your project. What these corporations do is they um, allocate those bonds to developers. The developers sell them in the open market. They, they gather their private financing um, and, and uh, accumulate their, their, their debt. And in exchange, we get um, long-term affordability on the projects that they build. And then there's our NOFA. Our NOFA is a standing solicitation. So any funds that come to us through the federal government, through the bonds, through general funds, or any other revenues that we might generate come through the NOFA. And we use it to buy down um, whatever financing gaps they may have. And what is the acronym? Notice of funding available. Now what you'll notice is that since roughly 2018, the combination of these different programs have produced almost 20,000 units. Okay? That is the activity that we have going on across these programs. Well, what's that? 2018 to now? The challenge that we've had is that while the production sounds good, there's no impact. I, I can drive you around to key neighborhoods, to key projects, but if you look around the area, you see that we're still struggling with everything from drug houses to environmental contamination to floodplain challenges, you name it, to, or to just overall economic blight. So, as we look to develop a new housing policy, we were trying to figure out how do we change from a production approach to a impact approach to really vitalize the needs. Can I, can I mm -hmm. one little note? So those units, the goal that the ones that were approved, those are what goes through that feeds through and needs funding or has the missing housing bonds. There's not the entire production of housing no. that the city is doing. So there's a lot of vitalizing so that's not the number of permits issued. The number of permits issued is completely Yes, this is a subset of that. Next slide. So our go forward plan. Next slide. What you see in this slide it is a web. And this web represents the intentions that the city manager and, um, and the city council has for how our various policies and programs should be working together. At the heart of this web, you have the racial equity plan. The racial equity plan is uh, cuts across all 42 departments in the city. Each of the departments worked with the consultants and the staff to figure out what should our big audacious goals be? If rules weren't an issue, if funding were, wasn't an issue, 
what should those goals be? Whether you're talking to the housing department, economic development department, water department, library services, humans, what should our goals be? So this is really where we want to get to. And, you know, um, our staff in, in planning and design actively working on Forward Dallas, which will be the city's comprehensive plan. That is intended to weave across and integrate each of these different elements. This is just the seven we're, we're, we're Next slide. So let me give you just a brief snapshot of our timeline of how we came to our new housing policy. We started in 2018 with the comprehensive housing policy, which I mentioned before, between January of 2021 and December of 2021. We did an equity audit. The um, Casey Thomas, for a uh, soon to be formed county council member of District 3, um, became chair of the Housing and Homeless Solutions Committee. And he called for a racial equity audit of our housing policy. I've got to admit, when I first got the assignment, I didn't know what a racial equity audit was. I know what a financial audit is. What's a racial equity audit? I spent some time with a number of folks in academia trying to gather some insight on how we should approach this. And next thing you know, a lot of people stopped returning my calls and emails. <laughs> They're like, it's too much. I can't help you. Okay. I'm like, yeah, here's all the great, wonderful things I'm trying to do. Based on 50 years worth of historic disinvestment. Can you help? <laughs> but what I did find were some practitioners um, through TDA consultants. Uh, I had one guy out of Seattle, two women out of Washington, D.C., that had worked on housing, that had worked on homelessness, and had spent recent years working on racial equity. And they could help me make the connections between what we were trying to do from a housing perspective, really developing that lens. They did a, a, a lot of work, essentially came up with 11 recommendations for changes that we needed to make to our current housing policy. Spent a lot of time in um, meetings, in conversations with residents, community stakeholders, uh, lenders, um, housing advocates, technical experts, trying to understand what they thought our priorities should be. Ultimately, what we came up with are what we call the seven pillars of housing equity. These seven pillars, when combined, make up Dallas Housing Policy 2033. So if you grew up in the, in the 80s, you maybe remember um, Voltron, or, or, or maybe you remember uh, Captain uh, Planet. <laughs> <laughs> and what you see with each of these analogies is everyone has a different focus, but when they come together, they're really um, impactful in a unified way. And that's really what we're trying to get at here with Dallas House Policy 133 through these seven pillars. So let's take a look at them. First, let's, let's take a look at what the, what, what the findings show. The findings of that racial equity audit that we did basically showed that the comprehensive House Policy is silent on equity. To the defense of staff and the consultants who worked on that policy, I've got to tell you, housing equity was not our focus at that time. Compliance, um, getting a handle on hemorrhaging that we were having from all these audit findings was the focus back then. But what this um, CHP had were 13 programs at the time. 13 programs that are basically like that chart that I showed you with um, each of the activities that we need to carry out, how housing activities. So, not exactly housing again. Next slide. It also found that there was no um, vision, there was no coordination. Remember that, that previous slide I showed you with the web? There was no coordination between all these different policies and plans. Um, there was no acknowledgement that the city had policies and practices in place that promoted segregation. 
and inequality. So part of the frustration in 2018 when UT Arlington presented a problem study was, here's a bunch of problems. Let me dump this on you, there, city council. And some of them will receive it with frustration. It's like, okay, we know the problem. What do we do now in public institutions? So, and, and, and that continues to be an issue. Um, and then again, um, this whole notion of trying to level, level the playing fields across uh, historic disadvantaged communities. No, no attention to those kinds of factors. Next slide. It went on yeah, um, show that there's no roadmap for a comprehensive plan. There's no um, funding or significant funding allocated to carry out this work. And there's no measurable goals for what we were going to accomplish, right? Take MIHDB, for example. Great program. No money is actually the largest producer of housing that we have in our staple of, of programs. No performance metrics. We're just sort of winging. All right, dealing with the projects that had a chance they come. Um, and then there, there's the inability of the policy and the programs that are tied to the policy to be nimble, to adjust to market challenges. So for example, we run a um, down payment assistance program. Well, it takes roughly 45 days for from the time we receive an application to the time that we're able to allocate the check. Well, what's a typical closing on a single family home? We got a problem there. So a lot, so when interest rates were low, and we would tell them it's about 45 days, they say, keep it. I'm gonna lose this house if I have to wait for you, right? Now, interest rates are up 7 8%. You've got people who can't use low interest rate primary mortgages to make the numbers work. So now they're Thor's best friend. Please help, help. Can, how much money do you say you have a, a home buyer? We need some of that, right? So being able to adjust to the market is really critical for us to be successful in executing these programs. Next slide. What you see here, and I'm not going to go through them, are the 11 recommendations that came out of that racial equity audit. And initially, when these recommendations were presented, I thought we were done. <laughs> All right. Here, you want to be racial equity audit? Here you go. But it's like, ah, not so fast. Now we want you to go and validate recommendations with the community with the stakeholders that you started meeting with on the front end and, and, and come back to us with some revised recommendations. Ultimately, what we realized was that the comprehensive housing policy was not built to do this, to do what these 11 recommendations show. The only way to really achieve this was to start over. So with the city manager's support and the city council's support, we literally set it aside and started from scratch. And that's what we're walking to. Next slide. So we started with our 11 recommendations. We knew that that was supposed to be our North Star, a target for what we were trying to accomplish. We did our research. We looked at the programs that we were working with, we looked at the gaps that we had between programs and needs. Um, we worked on a, a vision statement in th through these interactions with the community. We came up with this term called smart goals. The idea here was that when you're looking at revitalization, it's not like counting widgets, where you can say, okay, remember, remember I showed you that production chart? It shows you, here's how many units we produce, but we, I drive through the neighborhoods. It's like, what have you done? Can't see that anything's different. Right? I still can't walk down the street uh, because of all of these, these challenges. So what we realized was that we had to find a different tool to measure progress. 
And that could be smart goals that we can to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time bound, inclusive, and equitable. So this is what Vicky spends a lot of her time doing, trying to figure out what can be measured, what can be measured, much greater than just how many units you put on the ground. And then finally, accountability. It's easy for us to put words on the paper and make everyone happy and we can paint pretty pictures. But if we're not actually taking the accountability for realizing this, this vision, realizing the goals that we set in front of us, what, what, what value does it have? Next slide. So what this slide was designed to display is the relationship between activities that we carried out and the entities that need to be at the table in order for them to be effective. If you read it from left to right, what you see on the left are the, the 11 um, recommendations that came out of the racial health, the um, racial equity audit. As you work your way to the right in the green area, you see the engagement that we went through trying to understand what's important to you as technical experts, as residents, as housing advocates. As you work your way into the yellow, you see the seven pillars of housing equity that we came up with. That is what became the policy, right? The Captain Planet Ultron, right? That's that, that, right? Which was ultimately adopted by the city council. But then we have to take these words on paper and bring it to the way in which we do that by working across departments. So you having me here today, this isn't something that we really did in the past, right? But this is an example of how you're seeing us working across departments to help bring um, the different commissions, the different boards, the different staff, the different initiatives together so that we can figure out, okay, where are we fit? How are we aligned? with what these seven pillars advocating for. And then as you look at the different circles out here, you see the other parties that we have to bring to the table. It's not enough for us to work on our programs the housing department or for us to work across city departments. For us to really turn the dial on revitalization, we've got to work with members of the community. We've got to work with the small neighborhood associations. We've got to work with banks. We've got to work with investors. We've got to work with the private sector that has the capability of delivering some of these goals that we have we aspire to. So let's start with the first one. equity strategy targets. Dating back to the early 1990s. We have found, I have found programs that different administrations of this city have adopted to target resources um, in, 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 in different ways. And for one reason or another, that targeting approach has, has been, those programs that they came up with have not been sustained. The continuity that I found across those programs from the uh, Neighborhood Renaissance Program in 1993 to the uh, Neighborhood Plus that somebody may be familiar with in, was it 19, um, 2016? What you see is this constant push to target resources. You realize we've got a big city here, 380 square miles. We have limited resources. If we are going to be impactful, we've got to figure out how to channel those resources that we're developing, that we're allocating in a targeted manner. That, 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 that's the objective of our equity strategy targets. And they will look different um, based on what part of town that you're in. In, in, in certain parts of town, you'll see this. You'll see high density, you'll see towers, you'll see a lot of multifamily. In other parts of town, you'll see single family houses. 
in other parts of town, you'll see some combination of those two. Um, in established communities where there's no room for new development, you'll see us coming in and buying up existing properties that we can um, divert to serve or uh, to serve lower income families that wouldn't have otherwise been able to access those communities. Next slide. Then we have um, citywide production. This is something that the Housing Department, PUD, Development Services, the private sector, everyone can play a part in. We know that we need it. Half of our housing stock across the city was built prior to 1980. And depending on what neighborhood you find those, that, that housing stock, the conditions of it there, we have to strategically work through our current housing supply, restore it while we add to it. Remember, we're trying to totally build out the city. We're not um, like a Washington, D.C., for example, where there is no new land to build on. We still have green space. We still have infill opportunities. Council just adopted the Hensley Field Master Plan, which is the size of our central business district. Right? We've got huge opportunities to grow this city. This is one of the things. Next slide. Preservation. I talked about our home repair programs, which help um, seniors age in place. We've got in Dallas County alone over 3,000 properties that are valued under $50,000. Not because the dirt is, does it has, has low value but because the structures are in such poor condition that in many cases uninhabitable that they can't be used. So if you're just looking at numbers, you may think, oh, wow, we've got pretty substantial housing stock across the city. But when you start to look at it, we have folks who will prefer to double up and live with family rather than occupy those places right? because they're in such hard conditions. Then there's our naturally occurring affordable house. This is the housing stock that, and frankly, the majority of our lower income households rely on. These are typically apartment complexes anywhere from 10 to 20 units um, that were built between the 50s and maybe the 80s. They have no debt. So the landlords can afford to offer rents at a reasonable rate. Um, but they're not in the best condition. And what you see happening as DFW becomes a hotter and hotter market is that investors are coming in and coaching their products. And they're doing a few different things. They're either um, jacking up the rents and making no improvements just because they can. It, 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 I can put it many times we get a property in Bishop Arts District, which is a hot part of town. And you'll have households that were paying $650 a month, and now their rent just went up to $1,200. And they're like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Right? But the city has no ties to these properties. So there is nothing that we can do other than try to help them find somewhere else to live. And nine times out of 10, because we don't have the housing stock, we're sending them to some other city outside of Dallas. Here's the inspiring tax credit properties. Over the next 10 years, we've got roughly 70 tax credit properties that will expire, meaning that the financing that the state and the US Treasury provided to make those properties affordable have expired. So what you see with those fire tax credit properties is a couple things. On one hand, if they're in the District 13, or if they're in a, a, an area of town that where our market is high, the developers are just counting the days so those things expire so that they can jack up the rents, or so that they can knock it down, or so that they can um, rehabilitate it and, and generate market rents which means the folks who are living there, those subsidized rents, 
find someone else to go. And then you have um, those expiring tax credit properties in some of our high poverty areas. In those cases, they no longer have a watchdog looking over their shoulder, making sure that the plumbing is operating properly, making sure that the, the electricity is operating properly, the elevators, just the basic things. So that's where um, you have tenants screaming, saying, these people aren't handling the properties. What can we do? And the fact of the matter is, unless we have the right tool, unless we have um, some subsidy in the project, we are limited in our ability to impact those problems. So figuring out which of these expiring tax credit properties we can go after and re-up those um, tax credits or provide new financing to ensure that they continue to provide decent quality of life for residents, regardless of what part of town they're in, is pretty critical. And then there's the DHA funds, downtown city funds. They've got a number of properties that um, look like barracks. They're, they're very low density. Um, they're not in the greatest condition. And they're in some pretty uh, hot parts of town. We've got to figure out how can we add density? How can we improve the quality of life for those residents while we take others to those areas? There's a lot. Infrastructure. SMU recently came out with a study talking about our infrastructure deficit that we have across the city. We work on housing through the housing department, but there are a number of parts of town where we cannot build housing because they don't have aged water lines, which is what the water department requires for new construction, or they don't have water, period. They're still on septic tanks. They're on wells. So you've got to figure out, okay, how do I run water lines 300 yards from where they currently are to access my site? Infrastructure is a long-term investment that's needed, but if we don't start now, we're never going to get there. We're never going to activate some of the green space that we have across the city that offers opportunities to be developed. Next slide. Collaboration and coordination, which is why we're here. What we're here today. We started meeting with Andrea and Andrea and their teams um, several months ago, looking at how could we work together? What factors are going to be in um, um, Forward Dallas? What are the um, goals of rewriting the development code? Um, how can we start to channel those goals with these target areas that we're going to be identifying, where we want to see new investment coming online? Um, when you look across other departments of the city, take the water department, for example. Dallas Water Utilities is actively replacing water lines that were laid in 1920s and prior. We are doing some overlays, some GIS analysis to figure out where are those um, water lines that they're below, that they're um, um, replacing in relationship to the target areas where we're investing. We want to try to prioritize the replacement of what's going on with those target areas that we're going to be uh, selecting. Next slide. Engagement. Engagement is one, I've got to admit, has been relatively new for me. Right? What I call engagement is let me, as a practitioner, do my work. I'll bring you some ideas, or I'll bring you the plans that I come up with, and you can give me your feedback on those plans. Right? The challenge that we've had that approach historically is that no matter how smart we are, no matter how great we think our plans are, 
if they don't align with the needs or the perceptions of what we're doing with the folks who, who live in those areas, with the folks who um, are impacted by these decisions, we're not going to get very far. Right? And what I learned with recent projects is that when we do engagement effectively, job season. The math diseases, the, the, the getting through the bureaucracy is easy because that's what we're trained to do. But now we have this tailwind supporting us with residents who are coming out saying, yes, we want to see these kinds of activities moving forward. Yes, thank you for tearing down that meth lab on my street. Thank you for getting rid of the brothel that I have to deal with on a daily basis. Thank you for getting rid of the batch plant that I've had to suffer from and my children have had to suffer from breathing in every day. Right? When those when when engagement comes together at that scale, city staff, um, city boards, um, consultants can just be their job. So it's critically important that we continue to invest in this. Next slide. The seventh one. The seventh one is education. Education of what is mixed income housing development? What is community revitalization? I can't tell you how many meetings I go to or conversations that I have and people think that I'm trying to negatively impact their property values, that I'm trying to bring in undesirables to their area. What this education piece is intended to focus on is really relationship building, a continuous conversation that we've been having around. What is this? What is affordable housing? What is a table house? Who are these people that you're looking to bring into your community? How is that going to impact? I had folks tell me those people are going to go to school with my kids. They're not pit bulls. They don't bite. Right? They're folks just like you and I. So, so we need to have those conversations on a continuous basis. So that when we tee up a project, we're not starting from scratch. Just yesterday, uh, the city council adopted a, a project on the center street that is being built in District 10, right at the corner of Highway 75 and Forest. My staff had worked on that project for two years. And in many respects, I would have preferred not to do it because the level of time and resources that went into that one project, I could have done 10, right? But at the same time, when you look at what that project had to go through, the reality is, is that any project that fits that profile will have similar uphill battles if we don't start the education process now. One of the easiest things that I point to is sanitation. Because it we had residents complaining our trash is being picked up on time. What's going on? We had staff working overtime and still couldn't keep up. What they realized was, was that we weren't paying them. And we had to raise wages if we were going to recruit garbage truck drivers. That's an indirect effect on housing, on affordability, on how our ecosystem works together. When certain things are out of balance, you may not feel it right away, but when you caught Starbucks coffee, it's taking too long to come out, or your favorite restaurant can't fire or can't hire um, adequate staff, you start to feel it. 
It's like, okay, what adjustments do we need to make so that we can continue to live the life that we enjoy and the folks who um, work with us, particularly in the service sectors, can do the same. That's the start of the safety. Next slide. All right. So this timeline was developed when we adopted the housing policy in an effort to show you how we go from the comprehensive housing policy that was adopted in 2018 to the Dallas Housing Policy 2033. What you see on the left are in the yellow is our resource catalog. We adopted the housing policy in, um, actually in March, and we took those 13 programs that we have. They've actually grown to 18 now. We've got 18 programs, and we put, and we created a new document that's known as the resource catalog. So if you want to know what we do, what we can do, how we do it, you go to the resource catalog to see that. We're working with consultants to make it more user friendly. We are working with um, with staff to figure out what those small people. Remember, I told you our metrics, our performance metrics for each program. We have to develop annual goals for each program to show what we are expecting each of these programs to produce. That's a big question that uh, Chairman did with has been asking through the 2024 bond performance. What can you accomplish? If you give it X dollars, what can we accomplish? Those are the kinds of things that we need to be really figuring out through the um, programs that come up with the resource catalog. Then you've got more community engagement. Folks think of community, can, can community engagement is sort of a box that you check, but it's not. It's a continuous conversation around what's working, what are we doing right, where do we need to make adjustments. If you think about the relationship that you have with your primary care doctor, right? When you're young, you think, okay, I went to the doctor when I was this age. I don't need to see him again, right? No, 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 no. You need to be actively going to make sure that you're, you're staying in good health, that you're staying on track with whatever plan they've laid out for you. In this case, we as the city need to actively be going back to the community. Okay, so how are things working? Now that we've demolished this drug house, how are things working now that we've removed this encampment, this homeless encampment? Or what do you think about the new um, construction that's happening on your street, right? That's the kind of thing. We need that validation, that confirmation that we're on the right track. Um, and then there's this um, inclusive housing task force. Since 2018, when the health comprehensive housing policy was adopted, we, we have stood up variations of task forces. The task forces are intended to be advisory boards to sort of um, <clears throat> bounce ideas off of, to give us a, um, some feedback on what we're bringing forward and what's missing and what we should be doing. The challenge that we've had up until now is that none of those models have been. We, we started initially with a handful of, um, of uh, experts, of, of technically trained experts in, in the housing field. We moved to a much larger model of come one, come all. Anyone who has an interest in housing, um, join us on a webinar. Join us at an in person meeting. Um, review and sign up to our listserv. We need something in between. So what we're what what Thor and his team are working on is some combination of a task force that includes representatives who the council uh, appoint, um, representatives who have technical expertise on these various issues that we're we're talking about, and residents who live in these. It's not enough for me to cook the food if I'm not willing to eat it or if it's not part of the menu, right? The residents who live in these areas, if we're making investment decisions about their communities, they need to be able to. So that's what we're looking to bring forward. And um, all these things are sort of 
working um, together over the next 12 months. You've got a calendar of more specific activities that will be coming before the House of Public Solutions Committee in August. So we'll, we'll be in a better position to describe how the time is being used, what activities we expect to take place, that sort of thing. So uh, just to give you some, some of the specifics on where we are, um, we hired TDA and a um, different set of folks, but uh, same, same consulting firm to help us with the community engagement. This time around, we're coming to those meetings, to those convenings with our GIS analysis of where are those 1920 pipes? Where are those areas with environmental contamination? Where are those prime hot spots? Where are the areas of, of the city that we're planning to uh, introduce higher density? Um, how is what are the proposals for that? Um, we're trying to perform that the, the, the uh, new development code ideas yet. But ideally, what we want to be able to do is to light up a series of maps and show them we've done our overlays. This is what we're seeing as uh, potential target areas. And these are the kinds of, of factors that we believe we need to invest in. Are we on board? Is, is this what, what you see as needs? And then we want to work to consolidate them. My expectation is that we'll do this analysis, we'll come up with some 20 plus areas, and we got to figure out how to wind it down to a handful so, so that our dollars, our investments, our time over the next 10 years can really be impactful. We need their commitment to those areas. Um, Again, working across city departments to establish agreements and channeling our 18 programs to feed into those target areas in a calculated way. Next slide. We also know that we've got to work up, um, outside of the city. Um, it's not enough for the 42 departments and the housing, including the housing staff, to be getting on board. So we're reaching out to CISD. We're finding out where do they have vacant where do they have vacant land that they could be partnering with us on. Similarly with the Dallas Housing Authority, what are their priorities to redevelop their sites? Where can we partner with them on that? Got to do the same thing with Encore. Got to do the same thing with DARP, and there's probably others. But these are some examples of internal partnerships that we need if we're really going to be impactful. We started talking on Tuesday with the subcommittee um, around the 2024 bond about what changes could we be making internally to really deploy resources. And these are some of the things that, that we started looking at. Um, our Dallas Public Facility Corporation, it operates on a production basis. We've got to figure out how to start targeting some of those projects so that they can help us revitalize the target areas. We've got to look at, even though the tools are maybe designed to serve higher incomes, could we use bond funding to, to secure deeper affordability? Um, could these corporations be expanding program offerings? Right now, both corporations largely focus on large scale multiple. When I say large scale, anywhere from 100 units to 600 plus units, right? Um, we need to do more than just multi family. Could we be allocating city funding to the corporations to do them a wider variety? And then there's our mixed income house development bonus program. We were just having a conversation before we um, started about can we use MIHDP on a rehab project? Well, we haven't done that. We've always done new construction. We've always done multifamily. 
Can we do it by use on rehab? Can we use it on um, single family, right? We've got to figure those things out. And, and these are some of the growth opportunities that we see here. Then there's outsourcing. As much as we may appreciate the bureaucracies that we go through to um, adopt new programs and, and, and adopt new policies, we realize that it's not always the best approach if we're trying to um, develop timely. So we've got to figure out where does it make sense to um, outsource some of our programs, some of our activities, so that we can speed up the process. With that, I will stop there. And um, thank you. Question. Uh, yeah, in the last legislative session, there was a bill, Senate Bill 1787, that would have across the board allowed 31 units an acre minimum in all multifamily properties. I was interested and gratified to see that Mr. Erickson from your office testified in opposition to that bill. Could you comment on that approach to housing affordability particularly with respect to the availability of uh, mixed income housing uh, and the impact of that bill on that. So the housing department looks at house, we don't, I don't hire general contractors, or carpenters or anything like that. We hire um, administrators, financial administrators. And when you do the math, what you realize is that you can better achieve economies of scale when you um, build more units per acre on a site. What we are actively doing and working with our community staff is to figure out where can we do more of that? Where can we add density to the increase, expand the possible? Because at the end of the day, if you're only building one house an acre, right, then you're building for, you're, you're without explicitly saying it, you're saying that you have to have this level of income to afford to live here. By, by bringing down that, um, by adding more units per acre to a site, you are able to reduce those costs. The other piece that you asked about is, um, is, is mixed income communities. And um, you know, I live in District 12. There's a, a community that I like to drive through on Bent Trail. And I'll take my kids through the neighborhood just to teach them what mixed income housing looks like. And what you see is that at Preston Road, you see apartments. And those apartments are, are rented at an affordable rate for our working um, class uh, residents. As you continue driving, you pass the apartments and you'll see um, townhomes. Those townhomes are sold to people at a slightly higher um, level of income. If you drive, run to single family detached. Those are the middle class housing units. You keep driving as you get down to Dodd Campbell, you see luxury homes that sell for millions of dollars. But if you look at from where you are in the beginning at Preston with those apartments to where you end up with those luxury housing, you have a range of incomes of affordability that stem from about I'm going to say thirty to forty thousand dollars to millions, right? And by having them all living together, they're able to benefit from the same retail services, from the same schools, from the same investments that the city is making um, in infrastructure to parks. You name it. So I can't underestimate the value of mixed income because it's through those strategies that we're able to help a wider range of residents. Quick follow-up question. Are, would you be concerned 
that a 31 unit per acre by right entitlement would number one, diminish the incentives for the mixed income housing development bonus. And number two, result in the destruction of what I'll call naturally affordable existing properties. I'm not close enough to what 31 units an acre feels like, right? So I ask um, Andrea to, 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 to speak to that. Um, what I would say to the naturally occurring affordable housing is that by definition, it's the housing stock that's already there. So any changes that are made would affect new development. You don't build naturally occurring affordable housing today no. because the, the, the costs are too high. It's naturally expensive. It's not naturally expensive. <laughs> so, so I don't think it, it would have an effect on what's already in place. If, if I could buy it and tear it down and build 31 units, you don't think that would? Per acre? Yes. Um, well, I guess, how many units are there now? If it's R75, let's say five units. Um, I think this is a production <laughs> Yeah. But market rate. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is part of my thing. You know, why we have to fight against it, right? That the density required, let's say, twenty by example, across the city, um, without any context or consideration of the existing housing stock. While we need density, Forward House is looking at softer density throughout where it's more naturally progressing in corridors and where we can grow out over time. By right, just across the city, would bring useless density to Dallas just by right. And our worry that it was too dense just as a blanket approach because um, we had other planning initiatives and local things going on that one that we wanted to weigh in at the local level rather than the state level. If I may add something, I think the state law builds on something like the minimum lot size. So it's not 31, you replace seven, not seven, the person of five with 31 per acre. You, it also included the same bill with the minimum lot size. We're it's not that, yeah. Yeah. It's also required everything to be three stories and basically row homes in nature. And, yeah. I could go on about this for hours. We, and we can. <laughs> yeah, we probably will at some point, but not today. <laughs> um, I saw an example recently of naturally occurring affordable condos. Apartment complex that had been turned into single family, I guess, assembly ownership in a, an apartment configuration. And I know that doesn't happen very often, but the scenario that um, diminished the amount of affordable housing in our city was that the condo association wasn't able to um, do the upgrades that were necessary and were therefore forced to sell. And, you know, the, the apartment complex was torn down um, and, and those owners, those property owners lost their homes. And Texas recently changed the law that um, required previously that all homeowners be on board with a sale like that so that not all of the homeowners needed to be on board. I think it was something like 80% needed to be on board with a sale for the rest of them to lose their homes. Does this is this is that a, a program that the city of Dallas is considering where um, homeowners in that scenario would be able to access city funds, maybe a grant or a loan to access some kind of improvement funding to help them keep their homes? We've had questions about that, and um, it's tricky because it comes down to the tools that we have, which are mostly focused around income and the need that, that they have. So if each individual homeowner is qualifying for our program, right, by, based on their income, then yes. If, if not, we would have to build a program that served properties like that, right? For us to build a new program, we need to see enough projects that were in the pipeline that needed that kind of a service. One of the things that we're, we're debates we often have with council members is, do you build a new program 
for a project, or you build a new program for a stream of projects that are going to be coming over the next several years. So it's it's tricky, but that's that's the beauty of it. Two more questions. So in 2018, the goal was 20,000 units. Is there a number goal associated with the DHP 33? Oh, that's good. Cool. It's, it's, there's, there's not a goal. Um, and that's because the, the housing crisis continues to get deeper and deeper. And so there, there's really no set number of units that we achieve it to solve it. But what we look to do is put our budget into practice as, as best we can. Um, so we're, we're looking at our 2024 bond proposition to supplement our federal funding that we get, as well as the revenue from our corporations and family program. Um, if successful uh, with what we're projecting, we could we could subsidize about 31,000 units over the next 10 years, with our corporations adding about 90,000 units to the portfolio. Um, so that that would, that would our goal then would be to try to achieve 100,000 units in the next 10 years. But that, that's only a small percentage of the need. Our region is growing um, quite quickly, um, and that's going to be capturing all the people that our neighboring counties are. So we really want to be aggressive. The market, as well as our programs, need to produce as many units as possible uh, to be competitive to, to attract people to move to Dallas. Um, but the affordable housing crisis is just one where putting a number goal to it sort of defeats uh, our efforts. Uh, because it's just uh, changing and much more complex. So how do you measure progress? We measure progress through um, how many people are we able to serve on an annual basis? How many people are we able to serve? Uh, we look at factors in terms of who are we serving? What is their race, ethnicity, age? Um, we have a variety of um, indicators that we start to track of our racial equity plan. Uh, as well as all the smart goals that we're developing that will be focused on ambitious goals, but also with the racial equity lens, so that we can look at deploying our resources to areas that have been historically disadvantaged the most and start to deploy our resources to uh, address some of those historical challenges we've raised in our city. Question, Sam. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm talking to Molly about apologize. So uh, if you answered this, then I apologize for the question. First, I want to commend you on talking about the education about mixed income housing. I think one of the problems is people don't differentiate between affordable, you know, Section 8. They have all this, you know, this context that they think everything is the same. Like you said, it becomes those people that just drives the price. But on that, because we're also dealing with developers who have opted to do the fee in lieu as opposed to the fixed income housing. You know, I try to constantly talk them out of it, but whatever, that's their choice. What is being done and how are those funds being spent in fee in lieu and what are the plans for that? And you spoke about that, I apologize. Yeah, no, no, I hadn't spoken specifically about that. So the fee in lieu option came online in December. Yes. Right, so so um, we're less than six months in, or I guess right now it's like six months. We've gotten four projects that have taken advantage of it. We're seeing that the majority of projects that are using MIHDB are still um, doing on site port building, which is a good thing, right? It means that our fees are high enough that it's cheaper for them to do on site than it is for them to pay a fee. Um, we haven't started to deploy the funds yet, but we do have a project that we're recommending um, utilize some of these funds. But how will they be used? Is my uh, what are the different the options different. for use that so, are proposed? Okay. Right. So, so I, I earlier I showed that our um, NOFA, our development NOFA, which is our standing um, solicitation. Those funds would be offered through that solicitation um, for projects that have financial gaps. So, so we're really offering um, those funds through any one of our development programs. So what you're saying is if someone in a low-income area is trying to build affordable 
housing and they have a finance gap that they need this much more money that they can apply yes. to be in lieu to get it. Are there any other ways that it would be used? Like going to Commissioner Hopkins' question, is there a way that parts of that fund, because when we were doing uh, the West Oak Cliff, what came up in some of those areas were that people were homeowners and really, you know, and I understand their loan programs, but I was wondering, is there any way for people that couldn't qualify for loans but needed some rehab of their homes, are they able to get any of those funds? Yeah, yeah so, so the various 18 programs that we offer fit into one of four buckets. Either it's money to develop new housing, it's money to preserve existing housing, it's, it's um, down payment assistance to acquire housing, um, or, or, or we have land sales. Any one of those first three, development of new housing, preserve, preservation of existing, or down payment assistance um, to, to, to become a property owner, would be eligible programs for the theme of us. I think I need someone's hand up. Absolutely, you'll ask question, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, following up on that, do you have any kind of material that we can give to people who ask how the fee and lieu is being planned, is planned to be used? Do you have any kind of percentages of the fee and lieu that you intend to allocate to those various um, uses? Because, uh, you know, I I'm assuming that all four of the projects that have taken advantage of the fee and lieu have been in District 14? Yes. And our briefing. Yes. Yes. We, we, we did a briefing for um, our Housing and Homeless Solutions Committee on how we were recommending those funds be used. We can share that with you. Okay. That would be great. Um, because what I'm seeing is there's a real divergence between staff's recommendation um, in terms of the percentage of units that should be included as affordable units in a project and what percentage on the AFMI scale that they should fall in and what the fee is. So, for example, you know, if staff says you should have 10% at 60 to 80 AFMI in a project, a developer looks at that and says, well, when I extrapolate the cost of that at market rents today, and I consider, you know, what my operating cost is, what my um, difference in market rent and uh, that rent is, and all of the other factors, I'm looking at something that might be three times as expensive as the fee and lieu. So they're going to pick the fee and lieu every time. Is there an effort by staff to either reevaluate the fee based on location or to reevaluate the recommendations that staff is offering for projects based on location? I mean, I, I'm sure you guys have noticed that if I make a recommendation for a PD, the there's a big difference between what staff is recommending in terms of the amount of units and where they fall on the AFMI scale and what I'm recommending. And that's a product of trying to get closer to a break even between the fee and lieu and the units, because otherwise we're we're just not going to have affordable units in the high income or high opportunity area because they're going to pick the fee and lieu every single time. So what what is is that something you're so, considering? What efforts are you doing to address that? Right. So I, I wouldn't look at MIHDB in a box, right? I would look at the programs that we're deploying across the city. So I see MIHDB as one tool in the box, and it does very limited activities. Right, we will reevaluate it annually to figure out where adjustments are needed, but we won't turn MIHDB into our tax credit program. Right, we won't we we won't totally um, um, 
redesign the program because it's not hitting a particular goal. What we'll do is look at, okay, what is, what is MIHDB not doing, right? Like helping um, lower income households access these high opportunity areas and what other tools could we be supplementing it with to achieve that goal? For example, with our essential function bonds, we're able to go into some of those high opportunity areas and buy properties and bring affordability that MIHDB is not doing. Well, how does that get communicated to the market? How is that in, uh, information being communicated to the market? Um, right. Do you mean uh, the changes that that, that that we're looking at? A lot, a lot of this is through conversations with with developers. I'll tell you, I don't have a marketing budget, right? So whether it be us um, um, coming to events like this, or 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 events in the community, or displaying information. Um, through our communications department, we're trying to get it out as best we can. We, we, we've got a monthly newsletter. So, you know, we're using the resources that are available to us to, to get the word out, but there's still probably a lot of opportunity for us. Thank you, Debbie. Commissioner, we're going to keep going. I mean, if you can't please send out the PowerPoint to the commission, and, and of course, make sure if you have questions, Thanks. send them offline, and uh, we're so here, we'll respond to all of them. Oh, Ms. Warman, you're up first, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Just got us power through. Uh, you need to take a break. We need to get to work. So just make sure that we keep a form. Thank you. Ms. Warman. Thank you. This is Minor Amendment M223005. And it's an application for a merger for a minor amendment to an existing development plan and landscape plan in PD 612. It's approximately 28 acres and it's in Council of Three. It's located southeast of downtown along the east line of the front waterway, otherwise, it's a waterway. Uh, just north of the Denver Extension just and south of East Bay Barbary. Looking at the zoning map, you'll see uh, there's single family east of and northeast of the site, multi family to the south, and agricultural to the west. In summary, the development plan amendments reflect uh, reconfiguration to the existing to a currently proposed uh, activities class three building to increase the, increase the door area to, uh, to uh, increase at 29,000 square feet, uh, increase height on the proposed activities class three building um, by an additional three foot six inches and provide additional parking on the west side of the proposed activities building. The landscape plan, which is required to be approved uh, by City Plan Commission, uh, reflects the, the amendments being made to the development plan, and the uh, is to be is to be read per Article Ten, which it is. And Article Ten allows for the creation of a of an artificial lot to for the purposes of landscaping. That uh, to meet the landscaping requirements of Article 10 for that new construction. Uh, traffic management plan, there was an update submitted and uh, engineer was good with everything and there were no changes to the traffic plan itself. So this is the existing development plan and the area circled in red and what is currently proposed and was approved. Um, smaller footprint for the activities building with the parking being on the east side. 
the proposed development uh, chambers that it reconfigures that footprint to include the square footage and the parking that adds, adds parking to the west side of the The landscape plans, this is a little bit confusing for us to try to pull it all together as I remember, but the existing landscape plan, the area circle is going to be the area that is turns into <coughs> it would be it's called, considered the additional landscape area, and it is the artificial lot that is created for the purposes of uh, meeting on the new construction. Um, this is an existing landscape. This is the conservation area to the south of the site. Nice landscape plan on the last issue. Again, this is the changes to the sheet, um, but this is the conservation area to the south. And here is the artificial lot in proposed for the state of the state's article. Staff recommendation is completed. Thank you very much. Just one more question since we got depth on the update is. And so page number, but uh, the proposed conservation district is shown in the new plan. So there are no changes to that. The reason that it is shown as proposed is because we have to, it's it's part of the exhibit. And so they go there, no changes to that sheet. It has to be but there's no changes to it. Well, okay. Uh, so, my question is since the conservation district is a term of art in the development code, what we do with what we can do here? Would conservation area be a better? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Sir, I didn't get a chance to do the complete traffic plan, but I know um, there's been some traffic issues with. I'm not going to that. Has that been addressed or talked about at all? Um, there, no, not in this, because the what they submitted when the traffic parents and the update that they spoke to this um, didn't indicate that there was any need for change. Um, and actually, the, uh, let's see. So the the KP site plan that is approved is shown on the left side, and the right is the the study that was everything we're going to say. So coming off of um, and David Navarro's can speak more to this, but <coughs> um, the the this is a basically a private drive. The private street that comes off of uh, off of the Ledbetter extension. It comes up. So, and then entrance into the, the property is off of that private street. Yes, and we had practice that up all the way up to 408, uh, but these are questions I can ask that. And David Rice will be Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioners will keep going. Uh, the consent agenda today consists of cases three and four, five to come off consent. Commissioner will be handling case seven today. Oh, great. So, uh, case number three. Z2231132 um, is applicant yeah. for a new specific juice garment for a child care facility on a property that is on parcel 125. Is at the south corner of Frozen Road as Jordan can drive is approximately 1.6 acres in area. It is in East Dallas for East Dallas. Uh, it's off of, uh, as I was saying, Frozen Road. 
Um, is this former property that's currently being used as a church? As you can see on the area, there are two surface parking lots in the back or on the side, and then it's surrounded by a single family, surrounded by R75 on all sides, and the media process for uh, rent as well. I have a few snapshots. I did take a lot of pictures on the side, but always like the Google is way wider, so I like these wider angles a little bit better. Uh, so this is the corner of um, the purpose of the road and going to drive. This is the church. Uh, this is on the other side of the purpose of the uh, road, basically through the parking lots. You can see there's a little bit of a slope in there. Uh, across the street of Ferguson Road, single family homes. This is inside the property. So between the church property and the parking lot, there's an alley in the back, and this is where the property, the, the picture is taken from. So you can see the entire uh, how the two properties connect. This is the back that the arrow should be uh, uh, where you can get back to me. Again, looking on the inside of the property. The back of the church, going on Dorrington Drive. Um, this is the facade that's facing Dorrington, uh, adjacent property at the corner of Dorrington and the church. This is the proposed site plan, which is basically the existing building um, that's supposed to be used uh, for a job or display or portion. They, they are they're proposing to start using only a portion of the building, which is half of it. Uh, and then they will see it's a new daycare. They will see uh, if they will be able to expand. That's why it's an SUP. Um, you know, the development code allows the SUP to set a parking ratio. Look at what they have available on the site on the same property. They're going to restrike a little bit more to the parking lot to the east or to the right of the street, because this is not already the north. Um, so um, they're showing 31 parking spaces for 10 employees. It's a child care facility. They uh, were in um, conversations with us and David to ensure that the drop off and pick up can happen and uh, all the uh, operation can happen on this property only. The fact that they, they have access to this element of access too, but we have the closing places, we have all the drop off. And pick up coming of this uh, existing program and first time and getting out on the This is, uh, I wanted to show these three plots so we can see basically what's around it. With this being said, that recommendation is approval for a five year period subject to the site plan and conditions. Commissioner's questions? Uh, yes, regarding the implementation of the 31 unit, 31 parking space um, uh, provision. Um, am I right that right now that is implemented only by showing 31 spaces on the site plan? Yes. If I'm in building inspection and I look at that, how do I know that that was intended to reduce? The number of required parking spaces in the code rather than uh, assuming reliance on some remote parking. You're willing that that position should be put in the SAP conditions. Well, I'm, I'm not allowed to make parties. that affirmative statement, but would you think that would be a good idea? <laughs> okay. What do you mind? Um, Am I right that there is no condition right now limiting the floor area of the use? Yes. Okay. If the floor area of the use were to be expanded to, well, to be expanded, you would anticipate that that would increase the parking demand? It depends if, uh, so for drop your facilities, again, I'm dated here. <laughs> Uh, we estimate that usually the uh, parking uh, event is driven by the number of employees more than uh, the number of kids or parents because they kind of like it's, it's a child care. But, but it would be logical to assume that if they're using more of the building, they're probably having more employees. Yes, but they said they're going to have 10 now. So even if they double, they're still at 31. That's my point. Um, 
you don't see any need for a floor area limitation given that we're fixing the number of parking spaces um, uh, at 31 based on an assumption of 10 employees? No. Okay. Thank you. Just one follow-up. I should have been uh, child care <laughs> in another committee. Of, uh, and the only thing that I can see is with our efforts to make sure So it's one of the special points been how we could potentially think about things like site circulation, how the park would be considered. I heard you mention all those things as we went through this process. Any observations um, as you went through this that might inform how this is considered? For this site specifically? More generally for the city overall. Because it sounds like all the things that are being discussed that typically come out of the SCP process. And I guess, and again, I, I'm, I'm probably going beyond this case specifically. So <laughs> I can always follow up offline, but is would there be a consideration of size? Would there be a consideration? I think we've about talked about the 10 um, employees kind of helping define where you thought the parking would land. Are those types of things that um, staff considered this request that might influence how we think about this question more broadly? So for this, I, I, I don't want to go into the code. Like so I will talk a little bit about this type of situation and what we usually see. It's usually child care is using either some other exactly like the church for this instance. If they don't have overlapping hours, the church has a statement that obviously sometimes may have. Uh, so it's I think we should encourage this type of using or providing the community with the community supporting uses as churches want, community services is one, child care is one. These are the things that are supposed to be in the community to serve the needs of the surroundings. They, they typically are not, and I won't go into conversation about churches, but for child care, you would prefer child care not to be a destination, but be something for that community. And that's where you would prefer it's uh, you either drop off by walking, which I would love to be able to do that. You either drop off by on your way to work or on your way home. So yeah, for this situation particularly, um, I, yes, the employees need to park somewhere. That I would think that will drive. Um, how are they going to be able to operate the facility at that location? Because that's an employee parking is a little bit of a long-term parking for any type of facility. Um, we didn't, again, we didn't see a need for more parking. It's good to have the same building instead of having this property being empty five days a week. It's good to have it used and give it to the community in the use of that they need. I, that's how I would look at it. I also did few uh, SUPs for child care in an existing home. Um, I don't want this shit. In, on a block phase, and we were looking, and they only had like room for two parking spots. In the they had an arrangement with the school exam, and it was for the employees of the school to use child care services while they work on the school. So, again, yeah falls into the same point that child care facility is a need, is something like that needs to support the community, either the residents, either the uses surround it. So the parents again, it, you need some uh, you need some parking spots for the employees no matter how what the number is. And then by that the, the operation would limit itself because obviously the figure of what it is. Thank you. And one follow up, and this goes back to one of the comments we received, I think expressing the concern about how site circulation would work uh, relative to the um, existing street infrastructure. We talked about how it would be with uh, Mr. Navarro's in terms of circulating on site, trying to accommodate that, that drop off. Is there, I didn't see anything in the conditions per se, but is that part of staff's review and you think the site plan is maybe, I guess would staff think any additional conditions would be reflected to the site plan or conditions? 
wouldn't try it. It's not a massive generator for chalk care facilities. You don't have such a regiment with hours of chalk off and clean up as you would have for something in the school, right? Because again, it depends on the people, uh, uh, parents working hours, and it may be chalk off and clean up at any time in any case. They don't typically have the lunch. Sometimes they have it at seven, sometimes they have it at nine. Uh, yes, we did ask uh, the applicant to and to explain to us how they envision the drop off and pick up and the human line. Also, factoring the fact that it's a daycare, you need to, as a parent, to. It takes a little bit long. It's not like okay, I'm stopping that the kids can go out. You need to get out and unlock and all of that. So it takes a little bit more time. And that was done. We didn't have any concerns, but. Usually we do an engagement with conversation so that the applicant is aware that the op operation-wise, this is what they're going to have to consider. So we want their commitment and their understanding how they were going to operate this stuff. So again, unless David wants to ask something. No, and, and I will acknowledge, I read by the queuing when I read this originally, it is that queuing is only permitted inside the property, so that, that is actually addressed in the current provision. So thank you, Mr. Perry. Do you have a follow up, Commissioner? Uh, yes, Dr. McGrath. Based on our previous discussion, is it part of a staff recommendation that there be a condition requiring 31 parking spaces? Yes, yes, yes. So we are recommending. Yes, yes. yes. Can I do it? So, uh, mm -hmm. Sam, Sam. Anyone else? Folks online? It's a little hard to see. So. Feel free to pipe up if you've got questions. Thank you, sir. Commissioner, we're going to the right next case. I wanted to kind of reintroduce uh, the newest senior player on the 17 Liliana Garza. She joined us in March. Uh, today is her first case at CDC. I know they grow up so fast. <laughs> I also wanted to point out that um, y'all applauded very loudly and very enthusiastically for Donna's new planner, uh, TCM. <laughs> a few meetings ago, and I sincerely hope you applaud as loudly for her, her presentation. It's one of the stars. Just one quick note before we start it. Let the commission know that your mom is watching. You get like. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the application is for an R5A single family district, a property zoned base in the R community retail district. It is located on the southwest side of Burma Road, it's a piece of street. This is a joke, Joppy neighborhood. So um, this is an aerial map um, showing that there's mostly residential homes all around. 
And so zoning maps, so they're single family adjacent to the east, to the south uh, across Burma Road. And then uh, there is undeveloped land to the west. There is undeveloped property as well as general merchandise on the southwest of the property. Um, so background about the, the property, the area request is currently undeveloped and is zone C R community root home. The application requests an R5 single family district to allow a single family in the property. As for historical aerial maps, there used to be a home in that actual property, but it was demolished a couple of years ago. Um, so site plans, as I mentioned, um, it is surrounded by all single family homes to the northeast, to the northwest, um, adjacent to the east, to the south as well as single family. And then to the west, it is um, adjacent to a vacant lot. And then surrounding uses, um, as I mentioned, across Crystal um, and Burma Road to the northwest is also a single family. Uh, to the southwest of Pisca Street, um, across uh, Burma, to the southwest is actually a church. And then, as I mentioned, Adjacent to the west of the property is a vacant lot. And then, as I mentioned, from the northeast of the property, property there's actually a merchandise store. And then, um, development standards, it is downgrading um, to an R5A, so the friend will actually still continue to be 20 because um, the, on the block it is R5, so the constraining um, friend setback will be 20. And then, um, so it is in an area plan called the Trinity River Corridor from the Bible study. So the site is within the residential traditional module. The very uh, dwelling neighborhood and the guilt neighborhood protects and enhances and ties existing single family residential uses into the river Greenbelt and regional trail network. Uh, so staff is um, recommending approval of general request from R5 AC in the public district on properties of AC R Canary region. Retail district as there because this is around the majority of the surrounding zoning in the area. Super interesting questions, Commissioner. Anyone? Yes. So just to clarify, the, the old zoning that was in place was never used. No, I mean before previously as, as historical areas, it was um rest, it was a residential home, but um it was demolished and it was never used for CR. Okay, yeah. It, so why did CR put on it? Was this one of these historical things and just random zoning was put as I was when I was thinking, uh, that zone was since the transition from the Chapter 51A, a 51 to 51A since the later 1980s. Um, but there really was never a CR use in, in that um, lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, So it was CR. It had, it had a single family, the R5 single family, yes. or R7 family. So R5, R5, so it had R5, it was CR, so and are they just changing this one lot from CR to R5 or changing all of the CR? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And the applicant wants to build a building. So and I guess it's just maybe outside of what we're doing, but if it does it, okay, if it's never been in CR, well, this is a question for the applicant. No, no it's on consent. It's on consent. So if, if this is not do the whole entire be used. Um, the, the other properties, but this one the applicant was trying to build a, like a home. So does he own all of the lots? No, he just doesn't want Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, this briefly, the retail zoning has to be older than 1988 because the zoning transit would not have 
changed residential to retail. It probably dates from 1965 when the city across the board imposed higher zoning on single family neighborhoods in the belief that they would wither away by. I think during the transition, there was a, a conscious choice because in the 60s or the previous code had some sort of cumulative zoning. All right, it could have been shopping center and they exactly. had a choice between CR exactly. and multifamily. Exactly. So it, 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 it happened, for instance, for industrial properties. And we're, we're trying to like go down the rabbit hole because residential and industrial was not allowed, to my knowledge, in the 60s code, but it was allowed in the 40s code. So I think that was carried over. And I think it was a conscious choice by the community or the the voting bodies at that point, is it going to stay industrial or are we changing it to some reservation? So much. Any other questions, for sure. We'll keep it on. Thank you so much, Ms. Garza. We look forward to the agent space. Commissioner, uh, the director of the Flight Air Commission, Evans, and Conflict on Trust Number Five, and instead of having the room, Mr. Pay. Right. And I'm going to. Okay, that's visible online, looks like. Oh. All right, so this is Z223160. This one is located south of downtown Dallas, application for an MF2 subdistrict on property zoned in ARSC, Regional Service Commercial Subdistrict with in plan development. District 595, South Dallas Fair Park Special Purpose District on the southeast line of Sanger Avenue, southwest of Rig Street. It's only 7,800 square feet. Purpose of the request is to permit, excuse me, permit residential uses on the site. Here's the lot as it exists today. It's currently undeveloped. Uh, it's in a block that is generally zoned uh, PE5M5 MF2. It's the only lot in the immediate area that has that RSC on this side, south side of the block. To the northeast, there's a single family home. There's undeveloped properties to the southeast and uh, southwest. Farther south, there's multifamily established. Some undeveloped or office space uh, across Rig Street just to go further afield. And there's a large undeveloped lot across Sanger. So it is currently zoned that RSC commercial subdistrict. And it's RSC is generally something of a light industrial district. Functions kind of similar to CS uh, in the broader code. The applicant proposes to redevelop the site with residential uses and it will be consistent with the surrounding properties and approved area plans. So hop down into the site. We are on Sanger. There's a single family home on the the, I'm trying to make sure I'm looking at it the right way. Left on um, viewers left, which is to the east. It's undeveloped right now. And I'm going to flip around, look at uh, the industrial lots or uh, RSC lots that are across Sanger. Looking west on Sanger uh, towards, uh, towards South of Mark. You can see some of the multifamily way back in the background. There's a couple of undeveloped lots uh, nearby. That one happens to have an old bus on it, I guess. And those, and those are, again, those are the adjacent properties, not the subject. And then I've turned around, I'm um, farther up Sanger. Uh, there's an office parking lot there at Riggs and Sanger. And then that again is the RSC lot across the street. Oh, that's a single, the entrance of a single family home uh, near, um, excuse me, <laughs> near the corner of Riggs and Sanger. So just briefly, the development standards for the two subdistricts, their uh, RSC is an invention of PD 5 so it has those development standards. Um, MF2 in PD 5 generally uh, conforms very closely to the PD 5 
excuse me, the NF2 that you know in the base code. Uh, so it'll be very similar to that. But it allows same family to by small family. Uh, consistent with other uses on the block. Uh, land uses in RSC are generally uh, significantly more intense than the residential district they're proposing. Uh, I haven't included all of them because you, I assume you have no other reference point for RSC because uh, it's an uh, invention of this district. The only residential use allowed is a live work unit that requires a uh, commercial component. NF2 in DD Fire Fiber works very similarly to NF2. Uh, it's the same in uses. It just has a market garden as a potential thing uh, that requires an SUP. Otherwise, everything else is the same. <clears throat> Staff recommendation is approval. Thank you, sir. Questions? Seven thousand eight hundred and sixty four square feet. Okay. And what is to the, do you know what he's proposing or just changing the zoning to MF2? He's it's changing he's changing the zoning to MF2. He's stated it'll be it's a mill family or duplex, uh, which are permissible under the MF2. Okay. MF2 for what? Single family or duplex. Thank you. Sure. Just a couple quick questions. These may go to Dr. Andreas. She had a late night last night. Um, last night, council adopted the, the STR uh, ordinance or ordinances and defined as we did, as the planning commission did, STRs as a lodging use. This is in PD 595. So 595 lists allowed uses, right? It's not one that reflects base code. Okay. And PD 595 does not allow STR, so we're not here. That's correct. Okay. It's in the staff report for the bed. Probably we're going to come back with a little bit of a briefing of what passed because we're still figuring out if there are still to write the ordinance. But as an FYI, we did an analysis and PD 30, PD 193, downtown, the fair 595. Whatever decision would have been done on short term rentals of our activity would not have affected the PDs because these PDs call out the uses. Therefore, SDR use allowed, not allowed, is not allowed in those PDs. Because they don't specifically permit it. Yes, and they don't default to the base code. So, so. Yeah. And just a quick hypothetical let's just say this was a straight zoning to MF2. Outside of PD ninety five, PD five ninety five, council did allow them in multifamily by right, correct. However, council also, I believe, through the registration side, adopted regulations that said STRs are not allowed in multifamily development of twenty units or less. I don't. So that's where I need to figure okay. out because there are so many motions I haven't heard about. Yeah, that's correct. And I think it was also one that had a cap on three percent. So uh, the attorneys are writing okay. right now uh, based on what was discussed yesterday. We're going to have an internal briefing on that. Once it's clear, I'm probably going to bring Sarah and Stephen to brief it to you also. You know, it'd be great. It sounds like. Probably smaller multifamily, it would be more difficult, if not impossible, to add STRs. Larger multifamily is when you're allowed to do STRs by right. And yeah. with, yeah. The cap. Yeah. with the cap. Okay. Perfect. Just one of the secretary. Yes. And now that we started on something else. I forgot, so let me see if my my old memory can come back again. Yeah. Okay. We'll come back. Oh yes. Oh, I have. I remember. Uh, on on the PDs, the PDs are written so that it so now, and I guess it's more for legal. PDs are now written so that. The, so what is allowed is is in this defined, not what is not allowed. Or... Yeah. So, but okay. So the, does this P, this TV is by what is allowed or what is not allowed? I 
I used to I used to have a club, so mm -hmm. I used to know. That's why we gave Commissioner uh, Rashad will be verified. The uses that are not specified are allowed are specified in PD 595. Okay, so all right, thank you. Okay. Wow, this is this is changing the sub area in PD 595. That's correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. He's going to be coming back into the chamber, and he uh, would have enjoyed that. Oh, there he is. Welcome back, Mr. Young. We're going to be in case number six. That's okay. Come back with her if you're ready, Ron. Sure. All right. We'll skip the case number seven for sure. Good to see Oh, she is on that. Okay, first case, uh, I think it'd be the only case I got for you guys today. Uh, C212290, this was held um, last meeting. Uh, it has not been briefed, though, so I'll do that now. Uh, the request is for one, a specific use permit for the sale of alcoholic beverages in conjunction with a general merchandise or food store greater than 3,500 square feet, and two, a deep and liquor control overlay. My apologies, Mr. Parker, had to step out for a second, so uh, maybe we'll come back to this. Week. Well, yeah, yeah the next one. We're next one. Let's go to case number 11. That's going to be a go to July 6th. That one, man. And then you're not going to break the card? We're not going to break the card. So, as we go to break, we'll go in as many hours. Excuse me, would you please repeat what you just said about some particular case being delayed till July the 6th? The audio has a lot of cutouts. Yes, number 10. C223111 okay. will be held under advisement for July 6th. And then we're going to come back to brief the other ones uh, in just a moment. But if Ms. Munoz is online, then we'll go ahead and brief. Is Commissioner Brothers number 11 getting held? Yes, it's going to be held, but I do want to brief because I don't know what, I don't know what's going on. Okay. <laughs> what was presented, but I don't know. Okay, we'll have a briefing. Ms. Munoz is ready for that one. She was in and uh, she was saying that the quality of sound is poor, so I'm wondering if she's re logging. Okay. She wanted to she tried to wrap up with two. I can go to 13 if you want to. Okay. Okay. So she is set in the chamber. Case number 13. Oh, there's this. We're going to be 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 I'm sorry, everything's very choppy, and so I'm having a lot of trouble hearing everybody. But what I heard is, I guess we skipped over um, eight and nine. We're we're doing case number eleven. Eleven. Okay. Let me give me one moment to load that one. Thank you. Thank you. 
Да, я чуть не понял. Я не могу Can we see my presentation? It's, uh, it's, it's coming up. I'll want to bring great. Is it visible now? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Z212159. This is an application for a duplex district on property that's currently zoned an R75A single family district on the west side of South Prairie Creek Road, north of Fireside Drive. It's 1.38 acres. And the purpose of the request is to develop to excuse me, to develop the site with um, duplexes. And the property is located in southeast Dallas. Here is an aerial view. The property is undeveloped. Adjacent properties to the west are also undeveloped. To the north, we have um, we have one use that is exceeding down from a commercial service district, I believe, into the R75A with the machinery, heavy equipment, or truck sales and service use. Then we have the Fireside Recreation Center and Park. It's located farther to the west. And a single family use that's there to the, to the west if, within the floodplain area. Then to the south, we do have single family and a church use that are fronting along Fireside Drive. And to the east, we have some single family and um, some single family and uh, undeveloped properties as well. One moment, please. Okay, I hope um, everybody can see the presentation clearly. I was just working on what's being shown. Thank you. So background of this case, uh, it's, you know, about 60,000 square feet. It's unplatted and as you saw, undeveloped and wooded. The length of the property or majority of the frontage does face along South Prairie Creek Road, which is a six lane divided principal arterial road and um, our we are um, access manual states that they cannot actually have individual dwelling units with access onto this principal arterial road. And so for that reason, they'll have to plat the site and then create a shared access or maybe even a private road to the south where there's currently a private road. They'll have to dedicate um, some area there and create a shared access for the duplex development that they are proposing. Initially, they had requested an R5A single family district, and they did amend the application recently to have a duplex district to meet their development goals. Overall, um, both districts do allow both single family uses, but the duplex would allow one additional dwelling unit per lot. And then the minimum lot size would be reduced to 6,000 square feet or 3,000 square feet per dwelling unit. So again, it follows with the, you know, about half the lot area and double the density, which would increase the density um, and permit up to 10 lots with a maximum of 20 dwelling units. 
but in either scenario, the, there's still the dedication of right away easements and managing, of course, the natural configuration, the trees, whatever it is they need to get around from the environment um, on the site for development purposes. That will all influence the total number of lots and dwelling units permitted on the site once they reach that stage of development. And now I'm showing you some site photos. This is west from South Prairie Creek Road. And the surrounding land uses, this is to the north. There's a little bit of a wooded lot and then that adjacent um, heavy truck machinery use that's to the north which is located partially within that R75A district. And then we have single family uses, some undeveloped property, more single family to the Southeast. And then this is looking North on Fireside Drive, properties to the South, including single family and a church. And that property extends all the way up adjacent to the site to the South on Prairie Creek. The development standards are largely the same except for that major difference that I mentioned that would allow basically double the density on those lots um, with a slightly smaller lot size. And then although it doesn't really match the zoning in the area, as you can see, there are a few uses or different types and staff feels that it would be a form of gentle density to increase it and just allow one additional dwelling unit per lot and offer a new development type or a new residence, excuse me, residential type for this neighborhood with um, additional housing options for them. So the request is also supported by several goals as noted in my case report from the comprehensive plan in our housing policy, the neighborhood plus plan. Uh, related to encouraging diverse housing types and maintaining neighborhood character. This is not, it does not go astray so far. They're not building an apartment complex. They're just adding one additional dwelling unit per lot, which we found would be suitable. So staff recommendation is approval. Thank you very much. This, this case is gonna get held. So we'll just take a couple of questions from Commissioner Blair, please. Um, can you help me understand how this change uh, uh, from, I know, the Oscar originally had it, and and like I shared, his comment letter was was different from yours. So, how did the what was the rationale? Do you understand uh, that that went from the R five, which was more compatible with the, the surrounding community, to uh, to duplex? I'll let you answer that one first. What I can say is, in my assessment, I considered the availability of housing options for the neighborhood as a priority, as well as providing different those those diverse or different housing types to meet the goals of our comprehensive and housing plan and policies, where he took a focus of the more general and strict rule of maintaining a zoning district across um, a block, no matter the size. So he was more concerned with the mid block interruption of zoning. And I'm more concerned with trying to provide a diverse type of housing that's relatively similar and compatible in the area to for the neighborhood. I'm going to try to do just two more questions. Please. So we can move on. Um, did you consider the the uh, the neighborhood area plan or the, the community's um, land use plan when you made your recommendation? I was not able to find a land use plan for this site, and okay. I did not receive any comments from our neighborhood planning group regarding a neighborhood plan in this site. Which neighborhood plan are you referencing, Commissioner Blair? Um, the, this would be the East Lever area plan. That would be, no, that would okay. be, it would be West. This is West. West Lever. This is West Lever. This is Riley. Okay. Um, I will gladly reference it, especially since it's being held. Um, Generally speaking, though, is the West Kleberg plan not more amenable to single family zoning? 
Well, West Cleaver is is, is um, amenable to rural existence and not not uh, density, not one that has more density to it. Um, Understood. So. One more question, Commissioner Blair. Do you have another? Um, no, I can do it on the phone. Thank okay. You. And until then, until when? So what's the date? Is July um, 2020? This August, the first one in August. August. Because it has to go before the community again. August the 3rd? 3rd, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. August 3rd, Richard, sure spelled under advice until August 3rd. Ms. Williams, while we have you, we'll just go ahead and, and tick all your cases. So we'll go to case number 14. That's, yeah, 14, please. Okay, just a moment, please. So we're gonna stay with Miss Munoz and so that'll be we're gonna do five the eight with the We're gonna do fourteen. Oh, 14. Yeah. <laughs> what happened with 80? Oh, it's because. Yeah, we'll go back to all the B1 things. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it's Jennifer. <laughs> Okay, please let me know if you can see my screen. Looks like it's coming. Well, it's your own. It's what I'm sorry? I, I don't know what that screen says. Yeah, we can see your Google voice. Your email. Yeah. Okay. Let me try that again then. <laughs> We're doing 14. If we read this one before, there's a right? Yeah. Okay, and now can you see my presentation? It's working. There it is. We're ready. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, this next case is Z212301. It was remanded from City Council on March the 8th. Um, for CPC to here the case expanded to include the original PDS area, Tract 1, that houses the auto painting and body rebuilding inside shop use, and to permit the proposed open storage use by SUP only. So what they did is they did amend the application and add the SUP request and then we re-notified the public of the request, the amended request, with the expanded area of request being the whole PDS area now, the proposed track two, as well as the original area, and then notified them of the request for the SUP for the open storage use. They have now amended the conditions to allow for only one controlling pan, plan. Excuse me. So the PDS condition state that when an SUP is required, no development plan is required. That way there will not be more than one controlling plan. And then whenever there is no SUP required and they follow any other permitted uses within this track two section, they will have to provide a development plan per PD 193 regulations. Um, they previously recommended uh, that development plan and 
that plan that was recommended by CPC is exactly the same, but now called an SUP site plan. So nothing else has changed on that plan, and it is in the docket today. Now, what has changed are, number one, um, the SUP for proposed open storage. The red text is what has changed since the docket was posted. And additionally, we clarified the land use as being open storage now and limited to vehicles related to that auto painting and body rebuilding shop and remove the outside accessory motor vehicle storage use, which still has the word accessory. And this is not an accessory use in nature. It is a separate main use on track two now, but it is tied to the separate main use on track one. So we've tried to amend the language carefully to include those provisions. And in the SUP provisions, the prior um, negotiated standards regarding loading, lighting, and landscaping are all now included as SUP conditions. So these were emailed out to all CPC members at around 930 today. And uh, before, once they were mailed out, I had already, I had received um, an email from Commissioner Hampton and the applicant discussing the fence height and screening requirements. And it is the intention to have a maximum six foot high fence and not uh, a minimum. So that should be the maximum screening height. And of course, other screening provisions would still apply. They could do any combination of permitted screening with a maximum height of six feet. And here is the SUP site plan, which matches what was previously recommended for approval from that development plan uh, at CPC in January. Now, Commissioner Hampton and CPC members, would you like for me to go through the remainder of the presentation and show the site photos for Harvey's auto paint? I don't think it's necessary. If you're ready. For I would just. Question. Yeah, please okay. go ahead. I would just note that, yes, the acreage has increased from 0.358 acres to the total for the whole PDS now of 0.898 acres. And all the changes that are noted in the docket are the ones that, of course, are highlighted. And then in combination with the items in red text that were emailed to you this morning. And if you have any questions, I'm here. We're ready for questions. Can sure have that, please. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Munoz. I know this was a bit of a moving target the last few days. The change from the outside mm -hmm. accessory motor vehicle storage to open storage, it's the same use. It was simply clarifying this through review at the city attorney's office. Is that correct? Yes. As we continue to review um, the amended conditions, it just didn't make sense to keep it now defined as a separate main use yet still called an accessory use and then re removing the word accessory and and really the whole pds was created for that provision of accessory storage because it wasn't allowed in the district to begin with and so it's no longer accessory it's a main use therefore we could just revert back to the pd 193 standard which is open storage relating to the auto painting and body rebuilding shop use, and then refine it further for the specific requirements of the site. And open storage, uh, it's a specific defined use within PD-193, is that correct? Yes, it's a specific defined use, and it's also regulated further in many different uses that tend to have outside storage related to um, their land use. And are there other things that would be allowed beyond um, the vehicular storage or by tying it to the auto use? It would be intended to restrict what could happen on the site. Is that correct? Yes. In discussing the open storage use with the applicant, we did whittle it down to open storage related specifically to vehicles tied to the auto painting shop on tract one. Okay. And then one follow-up question on the um, fencing discussion. The proposed condition will be a maximum of six except as required for visual screening. So in other words, where visual screening will be required. Is that your understanding? Yes. And turning back to the original um, condition that was um, previously reviewed. And 
Yes, that is correct. Okay. You may have additional questions, but I'll defer. Thank you so much, Commissioner Young. Uh, Ms. Munoz, where in the ordinance would it limit outside storage to outside storage of vehicles? So in the PDS conditions that were emailed this morning, we added that verbiage highlighted in red. Um, okay, it's so more recent yes. than that. Yes, yes it, was, it was today. Thank you, sir. And what is the additional acreage? Was this just a clarification also? No, the, the additional acreage is including the original tract one area. The request you last heard was just to grow the PDS beyond the original limits. So it only included the new tract. And now we're including both tracts and notifying from that boundary. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Any last questions, Commissioner? Commissioner Carpenter. Yes, um, I, I haven't seen what you sent out this morning, but I'm assuming uh, based on your comments that you've addressed the issue of, of an accessory use and also limiting what can be stored under open storage. I have a question, additional question about the note on the site plan that says gate does not comply with city standards. If we pass this site plan, is it going to have to come back to us at some point? It um, will not have to come back to you, no. no. Not no. unless they amend what is being approved today. Okay, but if what is on the site does not comply with city standards, then how would it go forward if, when it gets to permitting? This was an issue with our engineering division and how they review it based off of um, our, I'm sorry, I, it's, it's evading me right now, the name of the, the handbook that we use, the Street paving. The what Street was that? Street Design yeah. Manual. Yes, thank you, Street Design Manual, where um, we make several recommendations in that manual that mm -hmm. aren't actually held for applicants to have to comply with. And so they're advised whenever they are not meeting the minimum standard per the manual, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to be acceptable. Something that they try to work in at permitting and if possible at zoning, but whenever they can't for some reason, this is when we would have a situation like this. And to avoid a future issue at permitting, they are kind of acknowledging that they're aware that this is going to be a discussion point, but it would get approved. All right, thank you. I have one other question about the recommendation for the time period of being five years with eligibility for auto renewals of four additional five year um, time periods. My understanding when we heard this case the first time was the community was supportive of it as sort of an interim um, you know, situation, but five years plus for five year periods is 25 years. Was, was there any movement on that in what you sent out this morning? No, there was not. The um, representative confirmed that that is their request, but did not give any details as to why. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, Commissioner? We will keep going then. Uh, Ms. Munoz, if you, you can, we'll keep going. And I see that you have half the docket. so. Uh, Commissioner's number 15 is actually not her case. It's Michael Pepe, so we'll go to 17. Just a moment as these load. I did have some troubles with our VPN today, so I do... Um, I did transfer them over to my local drive, and I'm just opening them from there instead since everything else is kind of choppy today. So apologies for the delay.
Okay, can everyone see my presentation? Yeah. Thank you. This next one is Z223130. It's an application for a specific use permit for a handicapped group dwelling unit and for the termination of its specific use permit number 552 for a foster home use on property zone in R5A single family district. It's located on the southeast line of Prosperity Avenue west of Stanley Smith Drive and it's just slightly over an acre. The existing SUP is for a foster home that's been serving the um, those with mental health issues and it was for children. And the purpose of this request is to redefine that land use to a handicapped group dwelling unit to match our current code requirements. And this requires a, an SUP if located closer than 1,000 feet from an existing registered group residential facility and all other licensed handicapped group dwelling units as defined in this chapter. There is another unit that is located um, directly across Prosperity Avenue. And so therefore, they are required to request this SUP in order to operate the group residential facility or handicapped group dwelling unit. For DCAD records, the site does have a one story 4740 square foot structure that was built in 1975. And let's see that SUP number 552, it was initiated um, by City Council June 14th, 1971 for a permanent time period. There were a few um, renewals and amendments back by the 80s. It was already a permanent time period and that was maintained until now when a code compliance visit determined that their land use was no longer consistent with a foster home use and they visited with development services and found their land used to be a handicapped group dwelling unit, which was something that we discussed thoroughly. So the applicant is certain that that will meet their needs and they will continue with their state licensing requirements based off of that land use. This property is located in Cedar Crest and it's between Bonnie View Road and Fordham uh, Road and Sunnyvale Street. So here is an aerial map that shows you the property is developed here on this half of the site with that foster home use. However, they do use the second half of this lot with a playground area that served the children for this use. And so they have amended their total area request from the original SUP area to this newly proposed SUP area um, to include that additional site that has that playground. And surrounding uses are all zoned for R5A and contain single family uses um, to the north, east, south, and west. And then there's a church use found to the north and to the west and additional undeveloped properties in all directions as well. And here we are looking at the property uh, from Prosperity Avenue south onto the site. And here are the surrounding properties. This is across Prosperity Avenue where we have single family uses and a church located to the northeast. And now we're looking at Stanley Smith Drive where there are undeveloped properties, single family homes. And then to the west along Prosperity, additional single family homes. The proposed SUP site plan shows all of the existing structures, which include the existing building, storage, and a recreational building. And then additionally, it shows the parking that's located behind the setback line along Prosperity Avenue and three additional spaces that are located um, adjacent to the recreational building towards the rear of the site. There are revised uh, proposed SUP conditions, which remove the hours of operation for this. Sorry, we've lost the audio online, or I have. I'm sorry? Mr. Carpenter? I think we lost her. Okay. No. We lost. We lose. My Carpenter. audio is working fine. That's correct. Eh? No, what about okay. So you can, everybody can still hear me then? Yeah, we can hear you, Ms. Munoz. Mr. Anderson, can you? Yes, I see some thumbs up. Please continue, Ms. Munoz. Great. Thank you. 
So these uh, revised proposed SUP conditions are the same as the docket, except for removing the hours of operation, because that's not necessary for this type of use. It's uh, considered a residential use in nature. Staff recommendation is approval of a specific use permit for a handicap group dwelling unit for a five year period with eligibility for automatic renewals for additional five year periods subject to a site plan and conditions as briefed and approval of the termination of the specific use permit for a foster home. Thank you so much. Questions, Mr. Young. Uh, yes, what is the difference between the foster home use and the handicap group dwelling unit use that? makes this use no longer compliant with its SUP. Just one moment. Yeah, just doing it. Right now, I am just trying to load the definition for foster home, which I did not think to include in my case report because I focused on the code compliance you, determination that it did not meet that. Would you prefer that I defer my question to the hearing? Um, Yes, I'll pull that up and I'll be able to share it at that time if you'd like. Actually, I think Mr. Moore has it. Yes, sir. Well, but my Thank question you. would be what about this use makes it no longer eligible for a okay. home? So that's probably a we can put yes. that for later. That's okay. I, I believe I have a letter from code compliance, but it was just very vague. That's why it just stated that it did not um, meet the definition any longer. We'll talk about But that. I'll double check that for you. Okay, we'll come back to that, Mr. Munoz, Commissioner Treadway. Can we hear the definition of foster? Yeah, sure. It's a facility that provides room, board, and supervision to five or more persons under 18 years of age who are not related by blood, parents, or adoption to the owner of operator of the facility. The folks online catch that? I yes. could not hear, no. Oh, okay. Stage voice? Yeah. Commissioner <laughs> Treadway? Oh, guys. Please. Um, it appeared that the owner of the property filed a response that said they're unaware of this change. Is that because it's being driven by code compliance? And um, I, can, can you just help me understand procedurally what's happening here? So there are more than one property owner for this uh, site. And one of the property owners provided a letter from code compliance to the other property owner that stated to please handle this situation and then signed it and dated it. And that was submitted by the second owner who submitted it with the zoning application, which there are only two remedies to a code compliance um, violation, which is either comply or apply for rezoning so they submitted the rezoning we qualified it as a letter of authorization and then once he received the letter in the mail he came and he submitted his letter um this is beyond what staff will be involved in so furthermore would have to be discussed by the two owners at the public hearing if they choose to go further into detail Okay, so our role as the commission is to just hear staff's report and then vote on that. And the fact that there may be an ownership dispute behind the scenes, we don't worry about. So, We've, yes, if you want to talk about it, Daniel, thank you. Yeah, so they're like Jennifer was saying there are two property owners, and one of the property owners 
gave a letter of authorization to the other property owner to do this zoning case, and is now the one who gave the authorization is now in opposition to it. <laughs> okay, that's all. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. what is our role today? Is to evaluate whether or not this SUP should be granted. Just the land use. Based on the land use rationale. Same question. Same question. Same question. Same question. Same question. Uh, my question is I didn't, I thought I heard something being said about distance between another life facility. And that's right. How close is the other facility? I have the exact measurement in my case report, which right now will not open for me. But if you would refer, uh, hold on, I believe it just opened one second. I can't <laughs> young has, my, my computer won't let me look up this. This is 65 stop. feet northeast. Oh. Yes, so it's pretty much the right of way line, just the right of way across the street. So do, is there not a standard? That uh, that that one is that we're supposed to uh, consider when trying to put these types of services next to each other. Hmm? No, there's no there's no additional provisions for consideration. So okay, wait a minute. So what did you say? Oh. That the distance is what's triggering the FTP. It's allowed by right unless it's within a thousand feet of a similar facility. That's correct, which it so, is. So. And that that's because it's within that thousand feet. That's why we're requiring okay, Thank you. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. I can't see anything because my computer won't let me pull up the documents. We can get you another yes. laptop. Yeah. Uh, any questions from our folks online? So, um, no questions. Ms. Munoz, we'll keep going to case number 19, please. Thank you. You guys blocking me. <laughs> Y'all don't want me to see. Not today. I guess I will can everyone see my screen? We can. Thank you. Wonderful. Z223155 is an application for a specific use permit for a commercial amusement inside limited to a live music venue and a commercial amusement outside on properties owned a regional retail district it's just over an acre on the south side of Samuel Boulevard between Sibley Avenue and Owenwood Avenue. And the purpose of this request is to redevelop these, these lots with a restaurant with live music inside and pickleball courts outside. The property is located in Owenwood. It is north of I-30. Again, on the south side of Samuel Boulevard, which is directly across the street from Tennyson Park Golf Course, Samuel Grand Park Aquatic Center, and Tennis Center. The surrounding land uses include, of course, the Samuel Grand Park Complex to the north, and that's in an R75A district. And then to the east, we have retail office and restaurant uses, undeveloped and auto-related uses to the southeast. And then to the south, we have single family uses that are non conforming to the district. To the west, we have a non conforming hotel. And then we have other auto related single family and undeveloped uses, and one multifamily use as well. So that whole section there is zoned a regional retail district, which is why a regional retail does not permit any uh, residential uses. So all the residential uses there are either non conforming or if they were established after the zoning, um, they would be illegal. But in this case, I have found them to be all constructed um, around the 1930s, 40s, therefore non-conforming. 
Here's an aerial map identifying the developed nature of the area and then the subject site, these, this collection of lots, which are currently undeveloped except for this corner on Owenwood Avenue, which has an existing alcoholic beverage establishment operating. And here we are looking at the property from Sibley Avenue adjacent to that hotel or motel use. And that's um, looking east onto the site. And now looking south onto the site, there does seem to have been some sort of a fueling station or something there previously. You see that sign posted there, the remainder of the property being first undeveloped, and then secondly, that alcoholic beverage establishment. And now we are turning onto Owenwood, looking at that fireplace lodge, or lounge, excuse me. And now the surrounding properties, this is north across Samuel Boulevard to the uh, park complex, complex and recreation center in the Tennyson golf course. And now we're looking east on Owenwood. So it would be adjacent to the, or the proposed pickleball, which is located mostly on the Samuel Boulevard, Owenwood Avenue frontage would be adjacent to this, which is the, um, there's a liquor store there and additional office and retail uses. And then south on Owenwood, we do have um, an undeveloped lot followed by a single family and some sort of a storage container business that is operated off of that lot as well. To the south on the Sibley side, we do have additional single family uses. And then an undeveloped lot to the west on Sibley. And then that um, motel use that's located to the west across Sibley. This is the proposed SUP site plan. It has um, this error here, as you see, I'm pointing my cursor. It didn't uh, account for the driveway opening on the east side and excluded some parking, but the total count was correct. And so that has been updated now to show the driveway on the east, and then the parking count is corrected. However, it still equates with the same total as before. Excuse me? No, keep going. I support. We're just... And I didn't mean to go over the site plan too quickly. Uh, we do have a proposed 3,100 square foot structure that's located on the northwest corner of the property facing Sibley Avenue in that motel use. It will have the um, live music venue within that structure or the commercial amusement inside limited to that live music venue, as well as on the covered patio area. And then the pickleball courts, there are 10 courts that are proposed. They are separated by a sidewalk that's four and a half feet in width, followed by parking. And then um, there's also a retaining wall and then a 10 foot proposed concrete alley giving about, I believe it was about 30 feet of separation from the pickleball courts to the adjacent single family properties. The pickleball courts do have a 10 foot netting and lighting uh, throughout the courts. And then they have their parking broken up into two sections uh, on the east side, all along the Owenwood Avenue. And then on the west side along Sibley adjacent to the live music venue. And this is the Lance, excuse me, this looks like actually the survey, but it was intended to be the survey of the existing trees. But there is also a landscape plan that I don't believe, I'm sorry, I put in here today. These are the proposed SUP conditions, and they identify that the use of the property must comply with the site plan and authorizes both the commercial amusement inside and the commercial amusement outside. And then it specifies the floor area for the commercial amusement inside, which is for the live music venue portion, is a total of 4,400 square feet separated into that single story structure as noted in the plan, as well as the covered patio. And then the commercial amusement outside is limited to those 10 sports courts as shown on the site plan as well. The maximum height for the netting is 15 feet, but overall on the site plan, it does note that the majority will be 10 feet in height. And then it also stipulates the hours of operation for these uses. 
The off street parking can be established by the SUP ordinance, which is exactly what they've done. And we'll go into the parking ratio more in just a moment. But these proposed SUP conditions also refer to the lighting having a maximum height of 15 feet in height measured from grade, and then additional pedestrian scale lighting as well with the lighting standards. The noise, can everyone hear me? It's cutting Hello? in and out. It's cutting in and out, the audio is. I hear you, Commissioner Carpenter. Can anyone at City Hall hear me right now? I think we lost City Hall. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting all the tiles flickering off and on. I don't know what's going on. Interesting. Okay. Well, let's see if we can get them back before we continue. Well, right, right now, I'm actually hearing you better than, than I was before. <laughs> Maybe we leave them off then. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's been it's been really difficult with the hearing situation, but I'm hoping we can hear something. Hi. Yes. Can you guys hear us in the briefing room now? Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It is up. We're at the uh, proposed SUP condition slide. Yes. Okay. Can you still see it now? Yes. yes. Yeah. We're hearing, I, I'm hearing very in, intermittent audio from the people who are present. I think, okay, did it just switch to the horseshoe now? And right now I'm hearing nothing from anyone in person. Yeah. Hi, Deborah. Commissioner Kingsman, can you hear me? I can. I can Hello. Hear you. How are you? Okay. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Commissioner Carpenter, can you hear me? I know that Commissioner Kingsman. I can hear you, Commissioner, okay. yes. And I could hear uh, Commissioner Kingsman. I can't see her, but I can hear her. Okay. But I can't hear anything from the people who are present in the briefing room. Yeah. You seem to have lost them, yep. It switched there. to the horseshoe. Yeah, what like is this on my time? Yes, it is. Yeah. We really need a hard connection. Does this actually have an internet for yeah. us? Yes. It says, you see, it says network connection issue. We can see you and hear you now. Yep. Can? Okay. Yes. I think we're good. Can our folks online hear us? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I don't know if we lost Commissioner Kingston now. No, I see her now. Yeah, she's there. Okay, great. We lost your presentation now. Yeah, I'm going to reshare it just in case there's any okay. kinks left in that. Start again with the proposed SUP conditions. I'm not Please. exactly sure what everybody heard, but I'm sorry. It was a long spiel. We need a hard one. I'm sure you will summarize now. All right, so our proposed SUP conditions refer to each of those individual uses and then the floor area for each of those uses, the maximum netting height of 15 feet in individual hours of operation. The off street parking can be established by the SUP ordinance, which we will discuss further in a moment. And then the lighting standards and provisions are added here for both the special lighting requirement for the um, 
for the courts as well as pedestrian scale lighting. There is a noise provision requiring that outdoor amplification be prohibited from 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. And then the landscaping must comply with the landscape plan that was also provided. And it's primarily due to, again, an inability to comply with the sidewalk design standards and buffering requirements along Sibley Avenue and Owenwood Avenue. Um, therefore, they provided a landscape plan to not require the buffering along those two street frontages of the sidewalk. Now, the parking required for each use based off of our code, it is permitted to be established by the SUP ordinance. They did provide information to staff, which was reviewed by our engineering division, and they did find it to be acceptable. Overall, it is a 57% reduction in the straight code requirements based off of Number one, for the commercial amusement inside use, being one space per 100 square feet of floor area, inclusive of that covered patio, which would total 44 spaces required. And then number two, the court area for the outside commercial amusement, which requires one space per 200 square feet of floor area, plus one space per 400 square feet of site area overall, exclusive of parking areas which would require a total of 82 parking spaces or a total of 126 for the site. They have proposed 54 parking spaces and uh, that includes several bicycle racks as well. Um, six racks throughout the site as noted in the two parking areas, both on the east towards Owenwood and on the west towards Sibley. <coughs> Staff's recommendation is approval for a three year period subject to revised site plan and conditions. And I did forget to include the landscape plan there. I apologize for that. So it would be subject to a revised site plan, a landscape plan and conditions. Thank you so much. Questions, Commissioner Hatton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Goodnews, I think you covered this pretty well, but on the parking, the revisions there was simply a clarification on the numerical listing. There's no change to the proposed number of parking on both vehicular and bicycle provided. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And then you mentioned the landscape plan. That is a requirement um, that would be within the SUP conditions. It's picking up the variance and the um, sidewalk and the buffering. It's simply in it over wood. Is it correct right. that those streets terminate um, at I-30 just directly south of the site? Yes. So they're not they're not connecting to anything. So having that variance wouldn't be anticipated to impact pedestrian mobility or any connectivity goals within the area. Is that fair? I I, I would agree with that. Yes. <laughs> And then the um, there's also some overhead utility ones that I think are along Samuel, uh, but they they met the planting requirements just by placing the trees in the board as shown on the landscape plan. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then um, I think there was some discussion regarding the feet loaders and the outdoor amplification. As it's listed in the conditions, is it correct that there'd be no outdoor amplification after 10 p.m. as it's listed in the conditions? That's correct. Okay. And then uh, one final question. The um, parking that's along the alley, you mentioned that there's going to be a 10-foot alley at the rear side. The applicant will be required to improve that alley um, to support the development of the site. Is that correct? I'm sorry, I lost you there. You said the applicant will be required, I believe, to improve the alley? Correct. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then are you aware if there was any um, community outreach or did you receive any feedback on this request? I did not. I received no phone calls or letters regarding this request. Okay. Um, and I, also, I noted that we received two um, ballots in opposition or two responses in opposition, um, but I didn't see any comments on those. And was just that there was nothing that was communicated to staff on the request. 
No, there was not. Okay. Well, I'll ask the applicant. I believe they'll be here on this afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Yes. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Commissioner? Uh, Commissioner I have Carpenter. one. Yes, please. Yes. Commissioner Carpenter. Thank you. Ms. Munoz, is it, is it the intention here to allow music outdoors across the entire site, or is it to be limited to that outdoor patio? For the live music venue, it is within the patio and interior building. Okay, but in the SUP conditions, it says that amplification is allowed from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., presumably for the entire site. Would that include the possibility of music being played over speakers across the entire site for, for those hours? I, I would, I would recommend asking the applicant further questions about their intention for the outdoor amplification beyond the live music venue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Okay, Ms. Ms. Munoz, we'll, we'll let you take a break. We'll come back. <laughs> go ahead. Walk the dog a little bit. Uh, we'll, we'll go back to order. Commissioners, go back to case number six. Dr. for joining us. She came back from walking the dog. <laughs> This, uh, the first one is uh, a case that was held under advisement uh, from the last hearing. This is Z212-276. It's an application for an amendment to plan development district number 825. Um, and it is on property bounded by uh, Palisade Drive, North Prairie Creek Road, Tonawanda Drive, and Greendale Drive. And then also a portion of the property is on the north side of Palisade Drive between North Prairie Creek Road and Greendale Drive, approximately 33 acres. It's located in District 5. Okay, uh, aerial map and the zone land use map. Um, the the bulk of the property is south of Palisade Drive, where my cursor is right now. Um, that's where all the school buildings, athletic fields, and everything are located. And then across uh, Palisade Drive that runs through the property, across that you'll see um, the parking lot where the, the preponderance of the parking for the school use um, is across that street. Um, other than that, it's uh, predominantly surrounded by a single family in an R75A, um, and there is a little bit of retail to the north on the other side of Bruton Road. Um, we're starting at the southeast corner of the property. Um, this is where um, the practice football field is located, uh, the subject of the athletic lighting that they're proposing. We'll circle back around and, and show you the vicinity of that. So I'm just going to work around the school. We've got single families surrounding it. Um, and then working our way up or over on, I think I was moving really fast. <laughs> Sorry, I forget there's such a, a delay. <clears throat> Is everybody running for that now? Um, uh, working our way along Tonawanda, the, we're looking at the site here. This is the location of what I believe is called out as area four on the development plan, um, where they're proposing to put the grove of trees, um, <clears throat> the grove of trees and some uh, pedestrian amenities and whatnot in this particular area. Um, and then going to uh, the corner of Tonawanda and Greendale, where the baseball softball fields are located. Also, again, showing you surrounding a single family. Um, and then working our way up Greendale. So I'm going to keep going with that. Just looking at the 
um, working our way up um, to uh, a little bit of parking over on this side. There may be an issue, I believe, in this area when we get to the parking lot here. There may be a bit of an issue with them fitting in the full five feet of sidewalk and the, the buffer and everything without um, taking out the curb. So um, uh, we had some discussions about where the sidewalk upgrade would occur on this property. Initially, we were talking about it being all along Greendale. Um, that's the way it's written in the in the case report. Um, but I need to confirm with them about this section that's adjacent to this parking area. Um, and then again, just working our way up towards the actual school building and uh, still on Greendale. Now we're up at the corner of Greendale and Palisade. And then Um, this is actually track two, where you see a surface parking across Palisade, surrounded by single family, and then a view of the alley behind. There we go. Um, alley behind. Um, one of the places that landscaping upgrades are going to happen is along this north perimeter of the surface lot. Um, the applicant has agreed to um, place... Um, trees along this north perimeter as well as uh, through the center aisle of this parking lot. There's not really anything that would trigger landscaping upgrades to this section of the property and it's just sitting there as a massively hot page area. Um, so as part of the zoning case, um, they are doing some upgrades here and we're triggering, triggering it that way. When they trigger Article 10 for the other property, they're going to do this as well. Um, and then the front of the school, um, you'll notice uh, here we've got where the, there's a section of sidewalk here that's immediately back of curb and the conditions allow it to go to zero buffer here. As long as they give a 10 foot sidewalk, so there's a section in front that they're going to be doing that. Um, but uh, elsewhere along this frontage of Palisade, they're going to be upgrading to the six foot wide sidewalks with the buffer. Um, and then this is just uh, a view of the site from North Prairie Creek. Uh, the football field, the practice field, we're looking at the practice field. You can kind of see the, well, not yet, but you will be able to see the yellow uprights. Um, and they, they are proposing to place four um, very tall um, uh, light standards for the athletic field with limited hours of operation. Um, and also, I believe this afternoon, the applicant is going to do a bit of a presentation to explain uh, to the commission what they're talking about with the international dark sky compliance. Um, it has quite a bit of um, benefit to the surrounding uh, properties in that there's not nearly as much uh, light pollution. And it, it's it's just, you'll see, the presentation will show you all there is to know about. Um, but um, across from now, I'm showing you this picture because it is a, a rather large roadway. It is a divided roadway. Um, and across, the single family across from this location, we're looking at side yards of the single family. We're not looking at people's front yards and we're not putting light standards right in the front yard. So making that point. Um, and then the existing development plan is just here for reference in case we would need it. Um, but the proposed development plan, um, the addition is actually in the center area of the property here. Um, they're showing locations where light standards will be around the athletic fields, and we can go into any detail on this if you would like to, but it's here for reference. Um, yes, ma'am. Are you ready for questions? I need to show the traffic management Please, plan. Please, go ahead. So the traffic management plan, um, the, the operations currently, uh, the predominant uh, queuing area is along Palisade Drive. Currently, during school zone hours, it goes in a single direction, uh, eastbound. Uh, the applicant is proposing, um, there's a signal coming in at the uh, intersection over here with North Clary Creek that will have a left turn signal. So the applicant is proposing to change Palisade Drive back to two-way during school zone hours. Um, I mentioned in the case report that they will initiate that process with uh, city council prior to permitting. Uh, but there's, other than that, there's not, it's not a real change to uh, traffic operations. And I will point out that the, the main area where queuing is occurring 
is a street that is surrounded by this property on both sides. So it's a little bit set off. Um, and then I have the conditions here in case anyone needs to discuss or have any questions about the conditions. One thing I do need to point out though, um, with the, the amenities section, I was really fast forward, the amenities section, we've received from feedback, some feedback from our city attorney's office that we need to go back to some older language in terms of instead of calling them public amenities, we would be using uh, the old verbiage that is pedestrian amenities. It's it's technical, it's minor, it's not gonna change the essence of what's happening or where things are gonna be located, um, but we do need to tweak that. And that's gonna be in all three of the school cases that you see today. So this one and uh, Urban Park and Kramer, I believe also, same kind of thing is gonna happen. This was the first round. The reason this came up, this is the first round where Rather than using the standard language that we have pedestrian amenities at regular intervals, not just feet or under property, uh, DISD uh, proposed that they would uh, focus those pedestrian amenities at certain frontages that made sense for the school and the neighborhood, and then they would also offer additional pedestrian amenities internal to the property. Um, and it, it balances out to be essentially the same amount of stuff. We're just kind of relocating and, and working with them on being flexible. Um, <clears throat> and other than that, uh, staff's recommendation is going to be approval subject to a revised development plan. Uh, the revisions to the development plan will be uh, cleanups for permitting, uh, making sure we have case numbers and no thing that says not for regulatory approval and just making sure it's ready to go. Um, but nothing substantive. And then traffic management plan in the case report says revised, but we're removing that. We're recommending approval with the traffic management plan as shown in the case report. Um, David and applicant, and we met again and all concur that the remaining items can be addressed at permitting and not essential to the operation of, of traffic here um, and conditions. With that, I will take awesome. questions. Sure try to write. So I just want to confirm, you said that Article 10 is triggered here. So this, yes, Article 10 is technically triggered. However, I would like to say that um, I want to explain a little bit about that. So when we have a school like this one, and eventually that's going to get to the Okay. So when we have a school like this one that is, it's an addition to an existing facility, Article 10 allows at permitting for applicants to do what is called a um, artificial. artificial lot. Thank you, I was losing the term. Um, an artificial lot, which basically they designate, and Phil can tell you the exact area, but basically an area surrounding the area of work can be designated and then Article 10 requires landscape in just that artificial lot area. So on a site like this, yeah. <laughs> so, so what that means is that, um, what that means is when I said earlier that there would be nothing really to trigger landscaping improvements up on track two, that's kind of what I'm getting at. It's not a track that they're actually ever gonna build anything on, it's meant for parking and so it will stay parking. And as long as they don't really build anything, there will be nothing to trigger it, um, but so we allowed the zoning case to, to trigger that and, and change the language to, uh, so that upgrades, we could, we're not gonna have the entire site compliant with Article 10 as if it were a brand new build on the site, um, but we are um, increasing the number of trees on the site and we're, we're getting a lot of trees in that parking area to take care of some of the heat and, and whatnot there. Okay, can, can I? Repeat back what I think I heard. Of course. So Article 10 is triggered by the new construction. Yes. Which is this additional building. Yes. Um, and as part of the mystery of Article 10, it can there can be an agreement that the improvements are not directly around the addition, they can be somewhere else on the lot. AKA not, this artificial lot. No, not exactly. No. So the artificial lot that gets triggered at permits is an option that they can use to, to instead of 
instead of um, doing landscaping, Article 10 landscaping for the entire site, which they would have to do on a new bill, Article 10 allows them, when they're doing an addition, just to do landscaping in that area, the immediate area of the addition. So landscaping upgrades in this case, because the addition is central to the site, landscaping improvements would only occur central to the site around that new build. Okay, and in this case, they can choose, instead of putting the landscape improvements around the addition, to say... No, they're going to... Do that at per they, day. They are. They are still going to do that. We're not missing out on that. We're not missing out on it. So this, the 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 landscaping upgrades that are listed in the docket are in addition to Article Ten artificial lot improvements that will occur at permitting. So they just agreed to go above and beyond. That's the answer. Yes. 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 Okay. yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They are. I'm going to butcher the explanation. If I have 100 acres and I'm only going to work, work on one, yeah. I can then say, well, I'm going to create an artificial lot where I can, the, you know, I'm only working on this one of the 100 acres. So Article 10 is not going to kick in and say, well, you have to now comply with the nine, 99 other acres. And that's what they could do here, but they have agreed to essentially turn what's a, kind of a tree desert yeah. to not a tree desert. Uh, Commissioner Young? Uh, yes, a couple of subjects, both related to conditions. Mm -hmm. First of all, I emailed you about the TMP update trigger, which is two years or when students begin attending classes, whichever is later. Mm -hmm. In the case of a school which is in continuous use, uh, does that need to be changed to within two years after students begin attending classes in the addition? Yes, thank you for bringing that up. I, I meant to mention that during the briefing. So uh, we did get your email and uh, we'll be updating the language to, okay, to so basically make sure that that, that distinction is made. Your okay. recommendation then would be the additions as brief. As brief, yes. yes. I have it in my briefing. <laughs> I have it in my notes. <laughs> so thank you for bringing that up because I didn't need it. Um, Other questions are these parking lot items. And I'm having trouble understanding the beyond. Okay. They are to be uh, simple parking lot. The length of two standard parking spaces. To me, it's the length of the standard parking space is 20 feet. So the length of two of them would be 40 feet. Well, they're 18, um, right. and so, so essentially 36. All right, so the length of 36 feet must be provided along the full length of the center parking lot. What if the center parking aisle is wider than, is longer than 36 feet? Okay, so we've got length going in two different directions. We've That's got the, my problem. Well, but, but length is, I guess, uh, kind of um, colloquially understood to be the longer of the two, if we need to reword it to make it more clear, we can, okay. but, but the length of the aisle goes this way. So am I understanding correctly that the island will run horizontally along the length of the aisle uh, with a maximum of 12 parking space width, and it will be at least 36 feet Deep, if you will. Yes, to a to a total square footage that's designated in uh, a square footage of surface soil that's designated in the conditions as well. So we've got thirty six feet um, in this case, north and south, thirty six feet, and then we're going to go wide enough to get that three hundred and sixty square feet of surface for planting, and then we're going to have parking spaces, but no more than twelve will be between each of those islands. Uh, I'll, I'll trust the board and his colleagues to draft that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, yeah, just a quick one. And I'm, I'm not sure I heard the end of what you were saying, Jennifer, but I'm about the lights. Yes, ma'am. Because I noticed you said the very tall lights, which I go. I, I knew. I mean, this was, I was waiting for you to say something. I was going to say. My head was going to turn around. Okay, so go back to what your explanation is why this is being proposed and allowed. Okay. So, okay, so um, first of all, we're specifying exactly, well, not, I mean, they can move a few feet one way or the other, but the location, there's going to be four of these uh, extra tall light standards. There's going to be two 
um, on either side of that practice football field. Um, they are going to comply with the International Dark Sky Standards for, and I can't remember, basically it's being a good neighbor and not putting a lot of light pollution um, out on other people's property. The applicant is going to have a presentation showing you more about those standards this afternoon. Okay. But the other part of this is um, the lights are located, um, by the way, that's one of the, the the fixes on the development plan is the text says that they have to comply with the setback. And so they're not complying with the setback on the plan. We're going to scoot them 20 feet from the property line. Then we have across um, a divided thoroughfare. And then the homes on the other side of that thoroughfare, those are side yards. We're not directly facing into anyone's front yard. Um, and I believe the combination of all those things will make this a workable. There's also, I'm sorry, there's also a day and time uh, hours of operation. And I think generally it's designed to be um, as good a neighbor as humanly possible under the circumstances. Out of curiosity, not to belabor it, but was there justification to say that if they're only going to be four, uh, to, that it spreads more over the football field being higher than it would lower is what I'm assuming. Yeah. I'll answer that. Yeah, and it's sure. actually two. There's there's two reasons. One, there's it's new technology, and the other one is just kind of geometry, right? If I'm if I'm trying to light my laptop here, and this is the side of the light, this is the height, it, it's going to be projected at an angle where it's going to cover a lot of this area, right? But if if the light is actually this high, then that projection is now pointing downward, and that's what you'll see in the presentation, which I'm sure we're going to be going really fast. So the higher the the, the poles, the direction of the lights can be pointed down and, and control the, better. It well, control better. And that's very true when you're using less poles that works, but you don't want to end up that you had eight poles doing that because it would be unnecessary and you couldn't. That's okay. And so, that's what you'll see in this present. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So also pointing out that um, this is a practice field. So this is it's only to be used um, by DISD UIL sponsored events for their practices. So in the winter, they did not have to be old school. Okay, I'm Liz. Okay, Commissioners, uh, it is 12.15. Let's take five minutes to go get our lunch and we'll come back and have a working lunch. Are we just going to continue the order? You want me to yes, do? yes. Yeah, well, we yeah, let's go ahead with that. <laughs> Okay, okay. Case number eleven is Z two one two dash two one one. Well. 12. 12 is case <laughs> case number 12 is Z212-211. Um, it is an application for an amendment to plan development district number 638 on property bounded by Tolan Street, North Jim Miller Road, Military Parkway, and Wilkes Avenue. Property is approximately 10 acres. Um, also in District 5, a little bit further north. Aerial and land use maps. Um, this property is a little bit unique for what we've been seeing in schools in that there are two pretty major thoroughfare uh, streets on two sides of the property and then two local streets on the other sides. Um, still predominantly surrounded by single family in R75A. Um, there are also a couple of churches across the street on two different frontages. There's a little bit of retail to the southeast along Military Parkway. And then across uh, Jim Miller Road, there is a fire station uh, right at the corner of Jim Miller and Poland. And yeah, so that's basically it. Um, 638 was established in May of 03. Um, it allows public school other than an open enrollment charter school by rights. Um, the existing public school is Urban Park Elementary. 
It remains in operation currently. However, it is uh, to be replaced by a brand new school and then demolished. Um, the current request um, includes, like I said, construction of a new elementary school, um, adding a TMP requirement to the PD since it does not currently have that requirement in the text. Um, landscaping is per Article 10, but unlike the last site, this is a brand new build, so the entire site will have to comply with the provisions of Article 10. Um, sidewalk improvements, pedestrian amenities, and text updates. Um, and then just going to take you around the school. This is actually the newest part of the school we're looking uh, from Military Parkway. Um, and this is the existing uh, drive and I guess best parking, physical parking area also on military. Um, <clears throat> and then working our way around, um, this is uh, at the corner of Military Parkway and Jim Miller. And the parking area that you see um, on the site there is actually going to be removed. And there's a couple of curb cuts on Jim Miller that are also being closed off and curb restored. Um, we are at the corner of Jim Miller and Jim Miller and Toland. It shouldn't say both there. It should say Jim Miller and Toland. Um, portables will obviously be gone. Um, and then I know because I'm confusing myself by showing you the site photo and then later this one going a bit out of order. Um, continuing around the site, they're going to build, as we've seen a number of times before, they're going to build on the undeveloped portion of the property, um, closer to the neighborhood in this case. And then demolish the school and build athletic, or not really athletic fields, but open spaces, play areas, and things like that. Okay, surrounding uses. Like I said, there's a couple of churches that, around the property. This is the one at uh, Jim Miller and Wilkes. Black. There's a big black. Um, and then at the, uh, to the southeast of the site, there's a, a CR area that has some uh, commercial, various commercial uses. Um, there's a fueling station, some auto related uses across the street from the site. Um, but again, predominantly, here's the fire station right at um, home, but predominantly, again, surrounded by single family. Um, again, I have the, the existing, the original and the existing development plans in here. If there's any reason to reference them, we certainly can. They're in the case report as well. Um, just kind of showing you the evolution of the site. As I mentioned, uh, they are closing uh, any existing curb cuts along Jim Miller. Um, they're expanding. I mean, this this uh, sort of circle drive is going to exist kind of in the same space with a little bit of adjustment, but you'll see in the traffic management plan that they're extending into the site so that they can get most of the queuing off of the public roadways. Um, this is the proposed development plan. And I'm gonna sort of add in as much as I possibly can. Um, so as I said, um, queuing is gonna come in in this uh, off of Military Parkway. There's also a queuing area on off of Poland Street. Um, they did have a third curb cuts along that roadway and they agreed to remove that and then to do a little bit of um, uh, magic to hide the back of house service area from the single family across Holland Street. So they've reconfigured that area. They've also, on the indented drive over here um, that they're creating along Wilkes, they've agreed to put in um, a bit of a curb so that we don't have people randomly coming in and out. And it's a little bit more organized for drop off and pick up. Um, and Phil has confirmed that the site as designed um, can 
can comply with Article 10, so there should be no issues there. Um, again, like on the last case, we're focusing pedestrian amenities at certain key areas. Generally, over here on Wilkes Avenue, um, adjacent to the sidewalk where drop off and pickup are, having, are, are going to be occurring, and then a couple of areas over here on Toland, and then a, a, another uh, grouping or a couple of groupings of pedestrian amenities will be more internal to site off of this loop trail that they're planning to build and so on and so forth. And there we go, traffic management plan. Um, there is the potential for a bit of backup traffic as you'll see on the lower left corner of your screen here when it comes up. Okay, lower left corner of the screen. Um, I will point out that there is, and I don't know the correct word for it, but there's an extra street along the side of Military Parkway. It's a bit more of a local street adjacent to the school, not the, the major lanes of traffic. So uh, the way they've designed this, that traffic will circulate in a clockwise manner so that they any overspill um, that can't queue on the property will actually be on this little side street right here. That's not on military. Not on the major traffic right. lanes of military. Sure. The side street, yes. So it's um, pointing out. Um, again, I have the conditions shown here um, in case we need to reference them. They are increasing the maximum height to 40 feet that's allowed. Um, other than that, it's, it's really the only change um, from 51A. Actually, they're reducing the, the the lot coverage as well, but that was the same as last time. Um, again, like on the last one, we're going to need to tweak the pedestrian amenity language and, and so on and so forth. Um, and about fences. Fences. Okay, so this was this was similar to same language, I think, as in the last one. Basically, um, making sure that the understanding is that fences need to comply with the the fifty one A provisions, um, but uh, in an, since it refers to an R758 base district, they wouldn't normally be allowed to put a six foot fence in a front yard. And so these are the conditions that say, okay, you can put a fence in the front yard here if all of these things are met. So an open fence instead of just solid, obviously. Um, and then making sure that uh, visibility triangles are, you know, the gates aren't in them, so we're resetting the gates and just making sure generally that we have um, a good situation otherwise. Okay. Yes. Um, and then I just put a blip in here to show you traffic management plan is being added. It's all the same standard language that you're used to seeing, but yeah, I'm not going to belabor that. Um, sidewalks in this case um, will be up to the new standard. Um, there is a provision that they can reduce that again to zero where that indented drop off and pickup happens. Um, and if they have a minimum eight foot wide and obstructive sidewalk, but it's really the front of their school. And so there's there's gonna be a lot of space there. They're just making sure that we have at least eight feet for walking and then for those pedestrian amenities. Um, and so approval on this one is subject to, or staff is recommending approval subject to a development plan, traffic management plan and conditions. Questions, Commissioner Young. Uh, same question about after students begin attending classes. Same answer. As brief. Yes. Brief. Yes. You. Conditions as brief. Thank you. I was. I kind of did that on purpose to see if you were paying attention. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, you, you know. By the time the case comes up, who knows? Okay. So <laughs> I'll remember. I'll remember. Them, but you know, when we get out and talk about something, we gotta get our game faces on, so I'll be ready. But here, you know. Just seeing. Any other questions on this item, commissioners? Okay. Don't tell me schools are getting boring. Uh, you know, you just have to pay on this sign. Okay. Appreciate it. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, commissioners, I think we can get one more case in. Uh, Kramer? Do you want to take Kramer? Let's do Kramer. Okay. It's not too. Commissioner Kramer has a conflict on this one and it's stepping out of the room. Yeah, my name is Reeves. So, uh, that's where we are. Commissioner's on my number 13, Bucky 13. Okay. 
Z212266 um, is an application. Sorry, I need to pull an application for an amendment to land development district number 665 to allow an addition to an existing public school, Arthur Kramer Elementary, that's on a block that's uh, bounded by Midbury, St. Jude, Maitland Dog, and Tunica Drive. It's uh, a little bit over nine acres in area. The location is in North Dallas, uh, somewhere by uh, 75. Uh, it's in a single family neighborhood, surrounded by single family all, uh, on all sides. Um, the school is already existing. They're planning an addition and um, the addition will trigger alert, the relocation of their playground. Uh, going around the block started at Midbury because Midbury is basically their main, main facade. So this is Midbury and um, St. Jude. Um, I was trying to, and probably I'll get back to this, um, I was trying to again show how the sidewalk is configured uh, and they have a little plaza in the front and then they have mature trees that are closer to the property line and you can see the sidewalk width. And I will mention that all of the <clears throat> four blocks, or the four blocks, the four um, sides, they all have the same configuration, like five, six foot buffer is already existing, four foot sidewalk. Um, now the other corner, um, Midbury Drive and Tunica Drive, you can see the playground that's on the corner. This is a better view, a better view of the playground. On Tunica Drive is a little bit of a slope uh, and they have a retaining wall. Um, Again, a better view of Tunica Drive with their retaining wall and the steps. This is the playground that is going to be relocated to make room for the addition that's going to face Tunica Drive. Just to show a little bit the, the grade, it's pretty, the, the slope is pretty significant. There is a little seating area that they have in here, and I think they're planning to basically do something similar a little bit on the other side. Um, they have portables. This is the view from Tunica Drive and Mason Dells. Again, as I was saying, look at the existing configuration. They already have sidewalks and they have another small retaining wall on um, Mason Dells. Same, this is for Mason Dells. Um, everything around it is single family. So um, this is the corner of Mason Dells and St. Jude's. This is, they have athletic fields in here and there's another little playground inside. And this is St. Jude's, that's where they have their um, access, um, their car access. They have this whole parking lot there on the side with their garbage dumpster. So this is their uh, servicing area. They have, I think, Proposing to replace with this one. The staff recommendation is subject to revise just because we need to clean it up a little bit. Um, the way they're showing the property dimensions is just cleaning up. I think there are some two lines on top of one another. This is absolutely nothing. Um, so the addition, they are coming a little bit closer. They're adding a little bit um, along Midbury, which is their front maintaining the plaza, and then their main addition is on Tunica, re basically remove, removing, uh, moving the playground to the interior. They are proposing, uh, they are proposing a pedestrian access to link to the, to the sidewalk on Mason Dells. 
the home. So it's interesting, important to mention that on Masondale and Midbury, you're going to have homes fronting this full bottom 20 times inches you have sides. Um, they are not going to touch Tunica at all. Um, they are going to touch only Midbury. That's why the conditions in the PD are to increase the sidewalk on Midbury and not touch the sidewalks on the other. So that was part of our agreement with them. But um, um, we are showing in here areas for the amenities. And we were trying to concentrate them as closer to the sidewalk as possible so they can have some sort of an unrestricted access. And obviously the fourth one around the playground location. So we have um, three areas that are very close to the sidewalk. They're going to have benches and trees. And in the conditions, we also include a condition for them to have it street trees on their property along Mason Dells, Mason Dell. 40 feet apart. So this is above and beyond an Article 10, as Jennifer was saying, because Article 10 is triggered, but it won't give us a big pump in and skipping. Um, this is their transportation management plan. This is showing the existing situation, and you can see they're queuing both lanes on Midbury, and the buses are on the corner. This is the improvement that they are proposing. This is what's in your report. I sent, as Yolanda to send you revisions, yeah, who was it? It was a little bit of just <clears throat> forth with staff, not significant. Uh, they made us for this queuing lane to be removed, and they basically cleaned up and uh, addressed that comment. Um, so you can see this is an updated, and the staff recommendation is going to be per the TMP as brief. The buses, they're planning to put the buses on site and queue uh, along the streets, but on Midbury is only one way. And they're also adding, let's see, this exhibit, which is something we, staff, requested to encourage the parents to move clockwise around the site, so it's continuous movement. And also, in what I sent you, as the applicant also provided a clouded version, so we can all see what the changes are. But again, it's a lot of red in here, but it's not necessarily a lot of changes. Another change that we asked for is to indicate that the pedestrian path is going to basically connect with the, with the sidewalks. But this pedestrian path is not necessarily a, an area where the kids are going to be dropped off and picked up. Major drop off and pick up is going to be on uh, Midbury Drive. Um, uh, development standards the same. Uh, we just quoted the setbacks, so there's no confusion at permitting at all. Um, changes to the PD just to like bring them up to code. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a revised language for the amenities. Uh, we're going to have, so all of these conditions are changing. We're adding, <laughs> we're adding conditions for landscaping. And for signs, just to explain, they are just proposing to basically move the big sign a little bit closer to the setback because of these trees to explain. And then this is your change during <laughs> um, subject to a revised development plan to clean up traffic management plan and conditions as well. Made it to the slide, can we put it down? Here with the third. Commissioners, any questions on this item? I do have one. Please. Um, or, in, in regards to our VIP schools, I know all of these schools have um, our favorite uh, portable on site. Do we have these discussions with our people to never bring those back? Like to think about that? <laughs> we are not. I would say to be used to the applicant about oh, yeah. that because it's my understanding that for this school they're going to maintain it for a little bit. Well. <laughs> okay. The commissioners, it is 12 47. That concludes the breaking down. So, the planning commission, we have about five minutes to go.